Mayor Christy Malchow. Deputy Mayor Kaylee Clark. Here. Council Member Karen Moran. Present. Council Member Karen Howe. Here. Council Member Amy Lamb. Here. Council Member Pamela Stewart. Here. Council Member Kent Treen. Present. And I'd like to um, move to excuse Mayor Malchow's absence as she's traveling for city business. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, I believe that is 6-0 um, uh, excuse for Mayor Malchow's absence. So for Pledge of Allegiance, uh, Council Member Moran, can you lead us? Okay, I will entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. All right, I have a first and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor Excuse say me. aye. 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 Opposed? All right, six zero, agenda is approved. So um, first up, we have executive session. So potential litigation pursuant to RCW 42.30.1101I. We do have two items and may take action afterwards. I believe is, you think 30 minutes, city manager? Yeah, I think let's, let's do 30 and uh, hopefully we'll get on time. Great, so back at 7.02. That sound good? All right, thank you guys. Carrie, did you have a question? No, I'll just see you in exec session. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Good evening. The council is extending the executive session until 7.15. Again, the council will extend the executive session till 7.15. Thank you. Good evening. The City Council is extending the executive session for additional five minutes till 7.20. Thank you. All right, Council. Um, I will entertain a motion if we have one. I move that we uh, direct our city attorneys to drop the appeal. All right, I don't have a second. All right. Could the maker of the motion clarify which appeal is being referred to? Sorry, in the, uh, what is it, the gerund appeal? but there was no second, so. All right, then I move that we direct the attorneys to request an extension um, on the appeal. A second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Did you wanna speak to your motion? I think there's there are still outstanding questions that we need answered and we don't have all the right players, so we need to get that before we move forward, or not. Is there any uh, further discussion? We just again, I'm hoping that the maker of the motion can clarify. Um, I just heard it generically stated as an extension for the appeal. Is this referring to the appeal or referring to um, a response to a motion to admit and consider new evidence? It is what um, you just said. <laughs> so it's regarding the motion asking the Court of Appeals to consider new evidence. You seek an extension Correct. of that? Yes, for whatever the Friday deadline is, we're seeking an extension for that. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Thank you for clarifying. <laughs> All right, do we have any other discussion? I know it's been moved and seconded. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Nay. 
All right, by a vote of one, two, three, four to two, uh, motion passes. I don't want to repeat that. I hope someone can send it to Lita <laughs> so I don't mess it up again. All right, thank you guys. Um, so next we have public comment. Um, so I think, do we have any in person? Cool. So we'll start with in person and then if you're on Zoom, um, I'll hand that over to our city clerk to do after. Thank you. All right, so first we have Dave Osmer. Go ahead when you're ready. Thank you. Good evening, council members. My name is Dave Osmer, and I live in Providence Point. I'm also the chair of our Homeowners Association's Government Affairs Committee. As you may know, our north gate exits onto 228th Avenue Southeast, just, so just north of Southeast 40th. Along with many other members of our community, I travel that route frequently to access Sammamish uh, shopping areas to the north as well as along Issaquah Pine Lake Road. I've submitted written comments on the draft TCIP projects TR 0254 and 107. Given time constraints, I will limit my oral remarks to specifically to TR 54. TR 54 is listed as the fourth highest priority project in the plan. It involves improvements to the 228th Southeast Southeast 40th intersection, which is listed as a current concurrency failure. This intersection is of significant interest to us. However, this project pales in comparison to the one strangely absent from your plan. The massive changes on 228th required to create the entrance and exit for the school district's proposed new high school and elementary school on the Providence Heights property. Providence Heights, <clears throat> excuse me, just southeast of 40th. As far as we know, even after over two years of stalling by the district to even make the application, there is still no right of way permit approved for, by your city for this project. The resulting increased traffic on 228th and associated cut through traffic on southeast 40th will have major adverse impacts on Sammamish residents, including those who commute via this route, as well as on our residents who use it to access Sammamish businesses. Since there is also no accompanying proposal for improvements to 228th north of 40th and beyond Issaquah Pine Lake Road, these impacts will include further congestion <clears throat> on both 228th and Issaquah Pine Lake Road leading to the likely failure of that intersection during peak travel periods. Why is this issue not being addressed in the plan? And why is there still no outcome of the school district's right of way permit application? And speaking of the school district, I note from the announcement of your June 7th public hearing that there is apparently a proposal afoot to exempt schools from concurrency standards. This is an outrageous idea for all kinds of reasons about which you will hear from me again on June 7th. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you so much. All right, next we have uh, Ramiro Valderrama. Thank you, former Deputy Mayor Ramiro Valderrama. I want to thank Council Members Lamb, Howe, Stewart, Clark, for taking the first step towards bringing the city closer to closure with Malchow Gate by voting to release the full city investigation of the city manager facts and findings, hopefully redacted to the 2018 standards. As the council members had stated previously, this will bring us closer to transparency of how the city does business. And as how and the constitution say, reminds the council that the citizens are the boss. This is a welcome step but only the first step. 
that is important towards the return to full, transparent, ethical, accountable government. Citizens will now be able to see what they paid for in this lengthy and costly investigation of over four months that had taken place. They will also try to comprehend why, despite what Mayor Malchow calls the dirty details, she pushed such an exorbitant payoff to the city manager up to $400,000, well beyond what was required, wrote a letter of accomplishments, then denied him his request for public hearing and effectively placed a gag order over him. However, now the city council needs to move forward and take needed actions to investigate the numerous publicly stated allegations that have been made against Mayor Malchow, former council member Tom Modell, and other council members, accusing them of serious ethics violations, mishandling of confidential information, improper interference in a city investigation, violations of state law, putting the city in legal jeopardy potentially, potentially legal actions against council members, Members, and misleading and non-responsiveness on public uh, records requests, all of which have left a cloud over the city and have leadership have uh, over the cloud, the city, the leadership, and embarrassed our city across the state. These on-the-record public allegations were made in public comments by Michael Scholes, City Manager David Rudet, Stephanie Rudet, and in the comment by Scott Hamilton. These individuals have equal standing and are likely more credible and more support as to the original allegations against the city manager made by the so-called resident city blogger, which Mayor Malchow and Council Member Odell insisted upon an investigation. It would be unethical and hypocritical of the council not to insist on similar investigations on the actions of Malchow, Odell, and others called for the similar behavior. And potentially these include more serious than what the past manager was alleged to have done. Only then can our citizens look into the rear view mirror and feel confident that Malchow Gate is behind us and move forward with the appropriate leadership and transparency. Our citizens deserve no less than to have that full transparency now given to them. Thank you very much. Oh, I had one second. <laughs> yeah, good job. Thank you so much. Uh, Tommy Overland. Hello, Council. Uh, I am talking here to request for the various TCIP projects that involve road expansions with bike lanes, that we upgrade those proposed bike lanes to protected, oh, do I have to hit a button? Okay. Uh, that we upgrade those proposed bike lanes to protected bike lanes. By upgrading those bike lanes to protected bike lanes, we would improve cyclist safety. By improving that cyclist safety, we would encourage more individuals of this community to utilize our bike lanes and cycle around our community. Doing so will have multiple positive impacts on our community. For one, we'll reduce traffic by taking cars off of the road. By taking cars off the road, we'll also reduce the wear that we as a community put on our shared road infrastructure, thus reducing the overall cost we have to spend to maintain that infrastructure. We'll also have positive health outcomes to the community as people get more exercise utilizing their commute in such a manner. And furthermore, we would also improve the independence of the children of the community. I've lived in this community for about 15 years at this point. I've gone through Discovery Elementary, Pine Lake Middle School, Skyline High School. And one thing that I have experienced myself throughout my many years at this community is that if you do not have access to a car, it is incredibly difficult to get around this community. One common thing that people bemoan is, why don't kids go outside and play anymore? Well, to people who ask that, I ask you the question, where and how are kids expected to get there? We've built our infrastructure such that if you don't have a car, you basically have no choice but to stay inside. So improving non-car transit options will help improve the independence of the youth of our community, improve the health of our community, and reduce traffic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. 
All right, um, last in person, I believe, unless we have another comment, um, is James Eastman. James Eastman, Sammamish, Washington. Uh, I think I, like most young kids, uh, their biggest fear is they become their parents. And now that I have four kids, I find myself uh, mimicking my father uh, when I'm yelling at my kids. I think, oh my gosh, I am my dad. Uh, that really hit home today. Um, I'm 43 years old. I also find myself uh, saying, man, what was my dad thinking having kids? It, it, he had me when he was 44, so I'm not even the age yet that my dad was when he had me. And so I like to uh, tell people if I'm a little slow or maybe if you find me forgetting things that my DNA is maybe a little bit degraded, but if you know me really well, it doesn't quite work because I have two younger brothers who were born when my dad was 46 and 48 and they're both doctors, so I just, I don't know, I just didn't hit the genetic lottery. But um, anyways, today when I walked in City Hall, McKay stopped me, the sound guy, and uh, he gave like a five minute explanation that um, really nicely that I was holding the mic too close to my mouth and driving everyone crazy with a sound. And I had flashbacks to my childhood because my dad was so old, he was born before penicillin was invented. And he had all these ear infections when he was a kid and they destroyed his ears. And so from the time that I grew up all the way till adulthood, he had hearing aids. And anytime he got in front of a large group of people with a mic, all of us kids would plug our ears and just wait for you know the mic to start screeching and you know this reverberation. So when McKay like approached me today, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm totally my dad, you know, screaming into the mic. So, um, but I'm on the north end of town, and East Lake Sammamish Parkway, uh, you know, T8 was created so it passed concurrency. Alternative Four was created so it passed concurrency. I think Alternative 4 dropped it from 1,700 vehicles to 1,000 vehicles, but whatever. It's the busiest uh, intersection or segment in town, no matter how you look at it. So I'm up here because I'm a little jealous of uh, the southern end of Sammamish. It seems like they're getting all the funding lately. Fall City Redmond Road is a wonderful project. I, I'm jealous of that. Uh, so I'm just up here advocating you guys throw a little money uh, our way to the north. That's where... All the failures are if uh, we actually monitored, monitored the segments there. Uh, so these could include uh, bike lanes. Uh, like Tommy said, we gotta get to the light rail. Like, let's throw some bike lanes in there, get people down to that trail. I know I look like I don't bike, but I actually rode the UW and back the other day because uh, I e-bike. Um, it's the new thing and it's wonderful. So uh, let's look at that and some other new technologies and throw some money to the north side of Sammamish. Thank you. Thank you for not yelling into the mic and for your comment. Um, do we have anyone else? All right, um, Lita, I'll let you take online. Uh, anybody online that would like to give public comment, please raise your hand. We currently have three hands up, and I'll promote the first first caller. <laughs> Stephanie Rudat. Hi all, um, my name is Stephanie Rudat. I'm calling in tonight about the shooting that occurred in Texas today. Um, I think that while the city government does not have the power to legislate over guns, you all are in a position to influence our school board members to, at the very least, make our campuses more secure. Right now, I, in the middle of a school day, can walk to my two nearest elementary schools, Blackwell and Margaret Mead, and walk straight into a classroom. Um, I know that council members Treen and Moran have a lot of interest in this because they have or do work for school districts. They know 
that a lot of the burden is on the teachers, and we do have a problem. Um, school boards could be doing a lot as they ask for money for levies, because maybe, I guess, our property taxes aren't giving them enough. They should absolutely not just be hiring security guards a la Issaquah School District, which is absolutely absurd, and at least have school resource officers. And they could easily be tapping into Sammamish PD to getting those resource officers, not just at the middle school and high school, but maybe even at our elementary schools. Our resource officers, when I talk to kids around here, they are saying how much they love them and that they're like counselors and they're really good people. Now, will they stop shootings? No, absolutely not. But 18 kids this morning ate their favorite cereal and they tied their shoes in double knots and they talked with each other on the school bus and they had no idea that they were going to die today. So if we at every level in the government are not doing something, something extreme, more than a proclamation, then we're doing nothing and we're allowing all of this to go on. Washington does not have good gun laws. It's a joke here. Um, if anything, any place is a model, I believe California is. Um, but my request in calling in tonight is that our council do something and then share with the community what you're doing and how we can join you in getting it accomplished. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will now promote the next caller. Tom O'Dell. Good evening, Council. Can you hear me okay? Okay, good. My name is Tom O'Dell. I'm a 30-year resident of Sammamish and a past member of the council, this council, as well as being a former mayor of the city. During last week's meeting's public comments, Stephanie Rudat directly attacked both Mayor Malchow and me for our roles in the council's internal investigation of former city manager Dave Rudat, her father. Her comments uh, were questionable, inaccurate, and possibly libelous. These accusations reinforced the need for having the full findings of the investigation released to this community without further delay. The investigation began approximately March 25th, 2021, when Deputy Mayor Malchow received a text message from a city resident containing screenshots of another text exchange between that resident and Ms. Rudat of an online discussion of city legals in a major legal, legal issues in a major legal case. Neither one was a party to the case and should not have had the knowledge that, of the legal detail that was contained in that text. The exchange clearly shows they did. Ms. Malchow correctly brought this to this council's attention. This is a serious indicate this indicates a serious confidentiality problem and raised concerns that Mr. Rudat may have failed to adequately protect confidential city information from his daughter, who then allegedly used it for her own purposes. After considerable discussion on May 18th, 2021. Council approved the hiring of an attorney from a major Seattle law firm who had considerable investigative experience by majority vote. She was given direction for the investigation by the council and the objectives along with the scope, together with access to information available to the council at that time. A second attorney from another reputable Seattle firm was hired again with council approval to act as its independent legal advisor on potential legal issues arising from this investigation. She was similarly briefed. I act as counsel liaison with both on administrative issues. I want to stress there was no preordained conclusion dressed at the investigation team. The investigator, despite a notable lack of cooperation from certain parties, did find a pattern of lapses by Mr. Rudat with respect to protecting the city's legal position. As you will read, 
was the full report. The investigation revealed others' issues of concern and which further called into question Mr. Rudat's leadership. Ms. Rudat claims that the allegations against her father were manufactured and represented an undue assault on her and her father, and the investigation was contrived to that end. This is unequivocally not the case. Proper procedures were followed. The investigator was free to determine methods and procedures with no interference from me or anyone else. All right, thank you so much. The conclusions are her own and not directed toward any preordained conclusion. Again, the full results and findings of the investigation need to be released to this community without further delay. Thank you. I'll now promote the final caller. Paul Stickney. Good evening, City Council. Happy special meeting agenda night. I'm gonna to speak to your meeting agenda topic about the six year TCIP, which I've learned to rename from uh, TIP. A couple issues that I wrote in on, I'll speak uh, briefly to. Um, on the, the first issue of three is on the single family housing and multifamily housing transportation impact fees. There's approximately projected over six years, 35 single family homes a year and 50 uh, multifamily homes a year. From a internal housing supply needs analysis basis, that's probably reasonable for single family homes relative to how many there are based on wants and needs of all the residents over a cycle of life, but it's woefully low on multifamily. My suggestion is to keep in mind in future years to set appropriate sustainable multifamily housing target numbers based on local housing needs and wants over a cycle of life and then reforecast the traffic impact fees on multifamily accordingly. The second topic is your TR 106 and the pavement overlay program status. It's unclear to me if TR 106 is the same thing as the prior pavement overlay programs or something else. It appears to me that they're not the same. It appears that TR-106 is targeting roads that have a rating of 30 or less, where in the past pavement overlay programs where from roughly 2008 to 18, I may not have those years perfect, but close, the city spent between three to four million a year to keep roads on an ongoing basis in the 70 to 80% range to keep them from being reconstructed as opposed to maintained and topped. I really suggest that you fund a pavement overlay um, program in that same range to continue that good work so we don't have to rebuild streets over time. The third thing I'd like to chat about is the four parts of TR05 and TR48, simply the parts of those that pertain to lane capacity, adding lanes, I don't believe are needed either pre-pandemic or post-pandemic, but I agree that issues such as traffic signals, turn lanes, other urban complete street amenities are appropriate. So I suggest that those be potentially modified, even though they're not current and they're looked at for the future, to focus on, not focus on lane capacity widening, but instead focus on safety, complete street features, turn lanes, queue jumps, intersection and ITS. And one last comment, I suggest all of you watch the last week's planning commission meeting. And one key comment there about housing over time, just one, is I am not saying that every single unmet need has to be met in Sammamish. What I am saying is that all local unmet housing shortage needs for all income levels need to be known and that information needs to inform housing policy to what degree those needs are all met. All right, thank you so much. Okay, have a good evening. All right, I think that's it. Yes, that concludes public comment for tonight.
Great, thank you so much. All right, so next we have a couple of proclamations. Um, so first is for Pride Month. And if y'all don't mind, I would love to take that one for obvious reasons. Um, <clears throat> so uh, proclamation, LGBTQ plus Pride Month, June 2022. Whereas our nation was founded upon the declaration that all people are created equal, that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are among the inalienable rights of every person, and that each person shall be accorded the equal protection of the law, and the LGBTQ plus community has made great strides forward, but equality, inclusion, and acceptance have not yet been fully achieved. We must practice these values and teach them to future generations. And the city of Sammamish is committed to fostering diversity and inclusion. And on June 28, 1969, patrons of the Stonewall Inn in New York City rose up and resisted harassment that had uh, become all too common for members of the community. Out of this resistance, the LGBTQ plus rights movement in America was born. During Pride Month, we commemorate the events of June 1969 and commit to achieving equal justice under law for LGBTQ plus Americans. Now be it resolved that Mayor Christy Malchow on behalf of Sammamish City Council does hereby proclaim June 2022 as Pride Month in the city of Sammamish and we encourage all residents to celebrate the progress within our culture towards justice, equality, and full civic recognition of LGBTQ plus persons and to join us in the fights that remain to be won. And as a moment of privilege, um, I do want to mention that discrimination does still exist. Um, you know, public schools in Florida right now can't teach students about sexual orientation or gender identity. Gender affirming treatment constitutes as child abuse in Texas. And just last week, Seattle Pacific University's board voted to uphold their policy on hiring discrimination based on sexual orientation. We must continue to advocate for each other and our youth. And I want to emphasize that here in Sammamish, all are welcome. Next week, um, June 1st at 9 a.m., uh, we'll all be raising the Progress Pride, Pride flag together here at City Hall. I believe there'll be some light snacks and refreshments after in the council cham chambers. And later that day at the farmer's market, there'll be a community art project with Cheryl Smith Mosaics that will be a Pride Progress flag that will hang in City Hall once it's all completed. So come put a piece of glass in and be a part of that. And um, thank you so much. So um, next proclamation, who National Gun Violence Awareness Day, um, Council Member Stewart. Yeah, thank you. Um, boy, this is a tough one today. June 3rd, 2022, National Gun Violence Awareness Day. Whereas every day, more than 100 Americans are killed by gun violence alongside more than 230 who are shot and wounded. And on average, there are more than 13,000 gun homicides every year. And whereas Americans are 25 times more likely to die by gun homicide than people in other high-income countries. And whereas Washington has 781 gun deaths every year, with a rate of 10.2 deaths per 100,000 people. Washington has the 40th highest rate of gun deaths in the U.S. Whereas gun homicides and assaults are concentrated in cities with more than half of all firearm-related deaths in the nation occurring in 127 cities. And whereas cities across the nation, including Sammamish, are working to end senseless violence with evidence-based solutions. And whereas protecting public safety in communities, in the communities they serve, mayor's highest responsibility is a mayor's and a council's and any government official's highest responsibility. And whereas support for the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding citizens goes hand in hand with keeping guns away from people with dangerous histories. And whereas mayors and law enforcement officers know their communities best and are the most familiar with local criminal activity and how to address it, are the best positioned to understand how to keep their citizens safe. And whereas gun violence prevention is more important than ever as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to exacerbate gun violence after more than a year of increased gun sales, increased calls to suicide and domestic violence hotlines, and an increase in city gun violence. And whereas in January 2013, Hada Pendleton was tragically shot and killed at age 15 on June 3rd, 2022. 
to recognize the 25th birthday of Hadia Pendleton, born on June 2nd, 1997, people across the United States will recognize National Gun Violence Awareness Day and wear orange in tribute to Hadia Pendleton and other victims of gun violence and the loved ones of those victims. Whereas the idea was inspired by a group of Hadia's friends who asked their classmates to commemorate her life by wearing orange. They chose this color because hunters wear orange to announce themselves to other hunters when out in the woods, and orange is a color that symbolizes the value of human life. And whereas anyone can join this campaign by pledging to wear orange on June 3rd, the first Friday in June in 2022, to help raise awareness about gun violence. And whereas by wearing orange on June 3rd, 2022, Americans will raise awareness about gun violence and honor the lives of gun violence victims and survivors. And whereas we renew our commitment to reduce gun violence and pledge to all, pledge to do all we can to keep firearms out of the wrong hands and encourage responsible gun ownership to help keep our children safe. Now therefore, be it resolved, sorry, that Mayor Christy Malchow on behalf of the City Council declares the first Friday in June, June 3rd, 2022 to be National Gun Violence Awareness Day. And we encourage all citizens to support their local community's efforts to prevent the tragic effects of gun violence and to honor and value human lives. And uh, if I may, I'd like a point of personal privilege um, given the events of today. Um, Rob Elementary School, May 2022, Santa Fe High School, May 2018, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, February 2018, Umpqua Community College, October 2015, Sandy Hook Elementary School, December 2012, Northern Illinois University, February 2008, Virginia Tech, April 2007, West Nickel Mines School, October 2006, Columbine High School, April 1999, and the list goes on to over 370 school shootings since 2000. Churches, mosques, temples, synagogues, concerts, grocery stores, and the list goes on. It is government's first and most important priority to protect its people. How can we conti continue to listen to the arguments that we don't need better gun safety laws? My youngest has to take 30 hours of class time and five hours of driving time and two tests, a written knowledge test and a practical test before being allowed to operate a vehicle that is potentially deadly, but not to designed to be so. And the vehicle must be insured and registered. Can anyone tell me why we don't have at least as many trainings and testing requirements in place to ensure our safety from guns that are in fact designed to kill? We must come together as a community, as a state, and as a country and take the necessary steps to ensure that our children are safe, that our worshipers are safe, that our people are safe from needless gun deaths and violence. And that, and that does not mean turning our schools into impenetrable fortresses. Please, we can and must do better. And please do not tell me that it is too soon because it is not too soon. It is far too late for those kids and that teacher today. How many elementary school students must perish before it's enough? Now I'd like to ask that we have a moment of silence, please. Thank you so much. 
Oh, all right. Um, sorry, this would be a tough one to follow. Um, Jeff Elikish, Audrey Starcy, and Doug McIntyre um, for our TCIP workshop is up next. Would anyone like a break as they come on? Anyone need a break? Cool. Let's do five minutes as they jump on. Thank you, guys. Are we ready to start? Yes, sorry, maybe you couldn't hear me. Yeah, T take it away. Okay, sorry about that. I was waiting for, yeah, it didn't come across. My apologies. Um, uh, Deputy Mayor, uh, Council Members, and Interim City Manager, my name is Jeff Elkish, Public Works Director. The purpose of tonight's agenda item is intended to provide an overview of the Transportation Capital Improvement Plan, also referred to as a TIP and or uh, TCIP. The focus of our discussion will be on the proposed transportation programs and projects for the years 2023 through 2028 and how they are balanced to reasonably anticipated revenue constraints during the upcoming six year period. Or said more simply, what might we study and or design and or build and how might we pay for it when it comes time to adopt the upcoming two year budget later this year? On a side note, staff did receive written comments from three council members over the past uh, two days, and we have prepared a draft response. Our response, our draft response has been emailed to you separately shortly before the meeting tonight. We anticipate that most of the questions raised will also be addressed during our presentation tonight. Our presenters and speakers will include Doug McIntyre, Senior Transportation Planning Manager, Audrey Starcy, our Deputy Public Works Director, and myself, your Public Works Director. With that, Doug, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Jeff. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, thank you. Good evening, Sammamish City Council. Uh, again, my name is Doug McIntyre. I'm with the Department of Public Works, and we're here to talk to you tonight about the 2023-2028 TIP. Um, we've had several presentations on this uh, effort to date, and today we're gonna go over the uh, draft plan, the first draft of the plan, get uh, input from council, and uh, make it changes as necessary. So more specifically today, we're gonna start with a little overview, um, background, uh, just a few repeated slides, just to kind of reemphasize some of the foundational elements of a TIP. Uh, we're gonna go over some clarifications. There's been some changes, uh, particularly since the agenda bill was published, uh, there have been some things that we tweaked and uh, improved based on some feedback that we received. Um, and then we're gonna go over the, uh, do an overview of the draft, uh, kind of navigate through that and explain the purpose of each element of the draft tip. Um, and then we're gonna do a kind of a deeper dive into the reasonable revenues that we're assuming, as well as the project assumptions in the tip. We will then follow up with some next steps and then open it up for council discussion where we will be seeking uh, input on changes and improvements to be made to the tip based on the information tonight. So again, um, just to reemphasize the, the main purpose that we're here tonight is to uh, allow the council to review, uh, confirm and or change the assumptions for both revenue and projects. Now, starting with a little background, uh, again, we've seen these, uh, these points before, uh, but I think it is really important, especially for the public to uh, see kind of the foundational pieces of the tip and what it means. Um, so all cities are required by state law to adopt a six year uh, comprehensive tip uh, that's pursuant to RCW 3577-010. Um, the TIP is also updated annually. It must be consistent with the comp plan, and it is a document that informs the city's budget, but is not itself a budget. Um, and then the TIP is a requirement for grant funding eligibility. And really the three main purposes of a TIP are to uh, be really transparent with the public about how we intend to invest in our system in the near term. Uh, it also identifies solutions to our system needs. There are various solutions needed. Um, and provides an overview of how we plan to implement the projects and over, uh, over the course of time. Um, a quick note here before we get into some of the, the meat of this is that uh, we did perform a SEPA review on this. Uh, we submitted the checklist to our DCD counterparts, that's the Department of Community Development, a couple weeks ago. Uh, they just today released a SEPA decision on it, uh, and it was a determination of non-significance at DNS. Um, and pursuant to our city code uh, listed there as SDC 21090301 sub D, 
Um, there is no administrative appeal process for that uh, action. So uh, I mentioned this earlier that we make some clarifications on a few things that have changed just so that council is aware uh, going into it. And I apologize, this is a little bit wordy, but um, I felt it was kind of important to get it all out there. So um, th these are both changes since the last workshop as well as uh, the publication of the agenda. So just keep that in mind. Um, the first one there, and there was a public comment about this earlier tonight, uh, but we added a new project to identify the work that the Issaquah School District is doing to mitigate their impacts to the system uh, resulting from the development of the elementary school 17 and high school four, number four at the Providence Heights campus. Um, we will talk about this a little bit more later, but uh, you'll notice that there is funding shown in the other category in the tip. Um, and that is money that is uh, coming from the Esquel School District. So the city is not funding that project. Um, that is a mitigation requirement of the district, um, but it will be uh, improvements to the city system. So we wanted to make sure we noted that. We thought that that was a good point and it was um, an oversight. So we wanted to fix that uh, oversight. Uh, the second one here is a pretty pretty important one and we have had some questions on this already. So just to reiterate though, we are now showing about $16.9 million in the general fund in balance column. Uh, that is new. That was not uh, shown in the last version of the revenue assumptions. Um, so couple reasons for this. One is that uh, we were directed not to consider new revenue streams at the last workshop. So that was an important piece of information. Um, and also uh, that a priority is to ensure that the TIF funds are still used on eligible projects. So um, this kind of creates a need where we need to complement the funding for TIF eligible projects. And what we mean there is that uh, only a few uh, projects are eligible for, for the use of TIF funds. And that's traffic impact fee, by the way. Sorry if I forgot to clarify that. Um, and and of those couple projects that are eligible to have TIF funds used, uh, you can only use a certain portion of the total project costs. So you must make up the difference with other funds. Um, and so general fund is used uh, in the draft TIF as you'll see later tonight uh, to make up that difference so that we can be eligible to use that TIF fund. Um, it is certainly within the council's purview to choose not to use the general fund in balance. That is uh, absolutely something that we can change, um, but there is considerations that uh, it's kind of like uh, a balancing act, you have to um, uh, reduce the amount of projects uh, very likely that you will be uh, including on the tip. So we can talk about that a little bit more later tonight, but uh, just uh, keep that in the back of your minds. Um, and then continuing on the clarifications, uh, we did want to note that uh, prioritization was incorporated into the rank scoring uh, using the methodology that was approved by council uh, last week through resolution R2022-952. Um, the scoring is uh, in the column of the tip. However, it was not. We did not have enough time to uh, re-rank it and uh, reorder it in the actual tip. So we, that is something we'll work on uh, by the time it comes back to council. So we tried to make it clear in the agenda bill uh, the ranking, um, but hopefully that wasn't too confusing. And hopefully we can clarify that if there are questions tonight. Um, and then number four there is uh, there were some questions at the last workshop on the 26th of April about how and just. More, more so to verify the assumptions that we're using for the traffic impact fee, um, specifically just how we project out over the six year window. And uh, we did do some digging on that and uh, we worked with our counterparts in community development as well as finance to um, update and review those numbers. And these are actually based on uh, permitting pipeline data. So this is hard data that we do have. Um, th this is assuming uh, or looking at projects that are currently in the pipeline between uh, and I have to be really clear about this because it is really important that it is projects that are between uh, complete application on preliminary subdivision review all the way through final reporting of subdivision. So uh, there's very kind of clear boundaries on what we're assuming in the permitting pipeline. And we broke it out by single family and multifamily. So over the six year uh, window, uh, the anticipated uh, permitting permit projects, uh, sorry, permits for single family residences, SFRs, uh, would be averaging about 35 per year. Uh, multifamily units is on average about 50 per year. And then what we do is we apply that to the uh, cost per unit. So there is, as shown on the screen there in the table, a uh, single family unit is $14,204 per, uh, per unit in, in traffic impact fee. Multifamily is about $8,719 per, uh, per unit. Um, and so when you do that math, you get about five, little, little under $5.6 million of new TIF revenue in the six year window. When you add that to existing TIF revenue or, that we already have, that has not been spent um, as of early April, you get about $13.4 million. And um, 
there were a couple questions on this that we can go over when we get to that point uh, later in the presentation. But just wanted to make sure that we did uh, close the loop with council that we did verify these this number and um, uh, wanted to make sure we verified. And the final clarification we have uh, is just uh, kind of hitting on the point that uh, a little bit more detail on uh, how does the TIP uh, work with you know funding commitments uh, for a project. So again, the TIP informs the city's budget. The TIP is not a budget. It helps us plan to budget. Um, it is really um, uh, you know a, a kind of setting the stage for how we budget. And later this year, the council will consider the biennial budget, and that will be a time where the rubber meets the road uh, for capital funding. Um, it is important to note that uh, we do balance this TIP. Uh, I know that's something that Jeff and Audrey and I have talked about in past presentations, that the difference between what we do now and what we've done in the past is that we are showing, uh, we're, we're showing the funding revenue sources that we can reasonably anticipate in the six-year window and showing how that each project is um, balanced with those revenue sources. So uh, it's kind of like a, a, a balloon. If you squeeze it in one area, it kind of pops out in another. So we want to make sure that it's all balanced and showing that there are no um, project costs that are shown that do not have a reasonably anticipated funding source. Um, and that's that's important, and this is a point that we've mentioned in the past, which is that um, according to our, our code, uh, concurrency modeling is, is affected by the financial commitments to projects in the TIP. So we do use this to help our uh, modeling for concurrency. So if a project is assumed to be built in that six-year window, we will put it into the model. Um, and then, and then obviously permitting is done through the, the outcomes of the model. Um, and then finally there on, this, on the slide is, uh, we do uh, have the six-year window, but we also have identified projects for the years, uh, out, the out years from seven to 20, um, just to uh, make sure that we're really clear about what we have on our radar, but do not fund or are not showing as being funded. That's uh, a really important part, just in case, you know, sometimes priorities might change, grant opportunities might change and um, allow us to kind of be a little bit more nimble and flexible with how we approach that. Okay, so now this is where uh, kind of the meat of this whole thing uh, starts. And I have a really hard to read uh, image on this slide, but I'm going to shift over to a document that I'm going to kind of live navigate for council. And um, so give me a little bit of grace if I, uh, I, if I uh, make, make some errors. Um, but so as, as you can see, uh, can everyone see the PDF on the screen? Is that coming through fine? I see some head. Okay. It's exactly. not readable by any normal human. Right, being. right. Yeah. <laughs> yep, totally fine. Yeah. Uh, it's not, this is not meant to be readable. Uh, if you let me uh, kind of explain here, I'll, I'll explain what's going on. So, this big, big sheet is, uh, is obviously huge. Um, the city has a lot of needs in the system, and we're trying to capture all or most of those needs um, so that we can show how we're planning. So, um, uh, I'm going to start with uh, the funding, the funding sources. So I'm going to zoom in, zoom in here. So you're kind of on a ride with me today. So just uh, buckle up, I guess. Um, so we've talked a little bit about these revenue sources in the past, and uh, we've gone through each, each anticipated source and shown what our assumptions are for each source. Um, the general fund column here is what we talked about earlier, the $16.9 million that we're uh, now showing. Uh, we've got the traffic impact fee column, the 11.9, which I'll, I'll get into this a little bit more. We have real estate excise tax, or otherwise known as REIT. Uh, and these are really um, high, high probability funding sources. These are sources that the city already has, is co already collecting, and can use on capital projects. Um, and then you get into uh, funding sources that are maybe a little bit less uh, high probability. So in this case, actually, the, the state has already appropriated $3 million to uh, the Lewis Thompson Road project. So this is funding that we do have, so we are showing that. Um, and then we have grant programs here. So we have the King County Flood uh, Control Board uh, um, grant uh, assumption of just a little under 600000 We are not showing state TIB, the Transportation Improvement Board. Um, and then we are showing uh, a little bit of funding, uh, $3 million under the PSRC federal grant. That is Assuming that we get the grant that we applied for a couple weeks ago for the Southeast 8th to 18th corridor, which is something that council directed us to apply for. Um, so if that is awarded, we will uh, confirm that. And if it's not, we will remove it from the spreadsheet. Um, we also have stormwater utility funding here, which um, Audrey will help uh, with this explanation in a little bit. And then of course we have the other funding category, which 
Um, I alluded to this earlier today, but the Issaquah School District uh, project that we just added today is uh, classified in the other category. Um, we, we are showing $8 million right now. We believe that's a relatively accurate number, but we are in the process of confirming that with the Issaquah School District. So um, that will likely change by the time you see this next. So we wanted to lay out the funding sources that we're showing. And then, if, and then um, if you zoom out over here on this side of the of the tip spreadsheet, you have the projects. So we have the revenues, and then we have the projects on the left. And this is this is where we identify the solutions that we need in our system. And this is this is um, uh, probably where we're going to spend a lot of time in our discussion tonight. Uh, we've identified in orange the projects that we are proposing to be included using the revenue that I just showed you in that six-year window. This includes projects as well as programs. Not all of the programs are funded, and that will be a discussion point tonight too, um, but uh, it's something that we wanted to uh, make sure we talk to council about. Um, and each project is listed in the column to the left with its identifier number uh, further to the left, and then a project description on the, in the middle right here. And this helps us understand what we're doing and where. Of course, each project has uh, its costs associated with it. And then in these middle columns right here, we are showing when we are allocating funding to that project over the six-year window, the 2023 to 2028 window. And then over here, we have the six-year totals uh, tallied up, as well as a, cumulative, a running accumulation uh, of the funding all the way down to the bottom. Um, and then, of course, uh, going back to the funding, now uh, when we're in these columns right here, we're able to show where that funding is coming from. So the funding that is shown in these middle columns is not tied to a revenue source explicitly, it's just tied to the time. And then when you get to the revenue sources, you can see exactly how we've broken it out. So as you can see, uh, just by way of example, the traffic impact fees really only have two projects that we can use funding for. And um, so this is a highly restricted source of funding. Um, and, then, and then, of course, in this case, which is this project right here, the Isquad Pilot Road corridor project, widening uh, phase one, uh, this is eligible for TIF funding. And to make sure that we balance it out, we've shown uh, funding coming from the general fund and being balanced right here. And that helps us uh, ensure that we're using TIF funding uh, for TIF eligible projects. So I'm going to zoom back out again and uh, go down to the very bottom of the spreadsheet, which is where our potential cash flow uh, item is. And this is where we can show how everything is balancing. Um, this is a uh, kind of a variation on the columns that you saw in the colors on the top right. Uh, we're showing them in uh, table format, uh, tallied by year, tallied by six year total, uh, and showing that the cash flow uh, by year balances. Uh, as you can see down here, when this difference row, if something was out of balance, you would see the variation in this row right here. So tonight, if we do get uh, input from council that we want to change projects, move projects around, we can try to do that on the fly. And you will probably see that this row right here will start shifting and showing uh, dollar amounts in here. And it's been Jeff and Audrey and my job to make, make sure that it's balancing. Again, it's really important that it balances so that we can show that we are uh, making those financial commitments and they you know, rooted in reality. Um, so this is a, uh, oops, sorry. Um, this is kind of the high-level overview of the, the tip. Uh, we're gonna, I have some slides that I'm going to shift back to that kind of walks us through the projects. Um, and I'm going to do that right now. OK. So um, we did talk uh, just a moment ago about the revenues. And uh, we wanted to show, in table format, uh, the math behind all this. So we're. Again, assuming about 16.9 in the general fund, of course, these are rounded. These uh, dollar figures, you know, we're, we're taking our best shot. So they are uh, approximate, they are rounded. Um, they, they may change in some cases by the time you see this again on the 7th of June. Uh, but these are our best guesses at predicting the future. Um, so general fund at 16.9 million, you got traffic impact fee at 11.9. Uh, in, in the uh, tip column, we show that by um, using the permitting pipeline, we can reasonably assume that we'll get about $13.4 million in TIF over the six-year window. But again, there's only two projects that we can use that funding for, and you can only use a certain portion of funding for each project. And that portion is just the growth-related portion. It is not the uh, kind of the existing deficiency-related portion of each project. And that's something that is kind of relatively inside baseball that, um, you can kind of spend a lot of time on, but um, suffice it to say that 
you cannot, in, in most cases for projects, you cannot assume 100% of the project can be paid with TIF. Um, again, these are restricted dollars. There are state laws around what we can do with this funding and how long we can keep the funding. Um, it's important uh, also about keeping the funding that we know that if we don't use the TIF funding, in, in, um, it's basically a 10-year window uh, minus a few exceptions. Um, you have to actually pay the TIF funding back. You cannot hold it for more than uh, allotted by state law. So again, highly restricted funding source. Um, real estate excise tax, every time a house is sold in the city, we get a portion of that, uh, that sale. And uh, over the course of um, the six year window, we're assuming about 18 million. Uh, this goes up and down quite a bit. It varies, it, it does vary quite a bit year to year. Um, so you, we're assuming an annualized $3 million on this. And uh, it is my understanding that this is split between parks capital and transportation capital. Um, and so our portion is that uh, three million annually. Again, we've received a state appropriation of $3 million for the Lewis Thompson Road project. We are building that into our TIF uh, uh, projections. Uh, we're also assuming $600,000 in King County flood reduction. Uh, and then again, the PSRC grant $3 million on that if you are successful on the Southeast 8th to 18th corridor. Um, storm, stormwater utility fee, we are assuming 4.7 there. And then uh, I mentioned this earlier, but the $8 million shown in the other funding is for the Issaquah School District project. Again, we're verifying that, and um, it's something that will very likely change by the next time you see this. So all said, um, oh, sorry, I skipped. Um, hey, Doug, are you uh, taking questions during the presentation, or do you want us to hold off? Um, let's hold off if we can. Cool. We have a lot of ground to cover. And, Is that uh, okay? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, please keep going. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you. And actually, I'm going to turn it over to Audrey for this slide. So, Audrey. Sorry, I was trying to find the mute button or unmute button. Um, good evening, Council. So, um, we did want to go over a little bit um, review with Council this evening um, the stormwater utilities contribution to transportation projects. So, um, our last rate study. Um, that was um, completed and adopted in 2017, did highlight and recommend um, through one of its issue papers that the utility continue to fund a portion of the transportation project. So um, that are stormwater components only. So the stormwater fund is a restricted enterprise fund. It has restrictions on it. Um, however, there are components of some capital projects with the transportation that, that um, would be applicable to this funding. So currently in our draft, um, TSIP, we've only included um, projects that are flooding or flooding mitigation projects. So um, Lewis Thompson Road, um, 212th and Endeavor Elementary School um, flood section right there. However, we would like to ask you this evening if you would like us to go ahead and assume that utilities should continue to fund um, the stormwater components of all eligible transportation projects in addition to those three. Um, and we can circle back if you want with some more information in terms of percentages. We do have a little bit of flexibility through our issue paper and how we can fund them. So we can actually use a um, budget to actual approach or um, oftentimes cities will end up um, applying a percentage for planning purposes through that effort. So a lot of times cities will select either 10, 15 or 20 percent um, of that project will be essentially contributed and allocated through the stormwater 438 fund. If you have questions on that, that feel free to ask. If not, we would just, um, I guess, like some guidance around if we should assume that as a revenue source for the TSIP. Council Member Stewart. Yeah, is there any reason why we wouldn't want the utility to continue to fund stormwater components? Um, not necessarily, just wanted you to also be aware, you know, we are in the middle of a rate study for the utility, um, and we'll be circling back in July with a list of capital projects. So um, this funding source right now, if we assume 20% um, allocation from the utility for transportation projects, we'll be competing with um, a long list of stormwater capital projects as well. So just keeping that in mind as we move through the rate study on the stormwater side. Great. Jeff, go ahead. Uh, Audrey covered it. It's the um, uh, competing interests would be a reason why you would not want to. There's so many you know, retrofit projects and storm stuff that there's just not enough money to go around. So we have to prioritize where best to fit it. And Audrey covered that and we'll continue. So thank you. 
So is this your recommended list of, of what you think we should have towards transportation projects, or have you guys not had a chance to do that reconciliation across the stormwater retrofit and these projects? We will be um, coming back in July with a in a study session to fully discuss all the stormwater um, transportation. Pro I'm sorry, stormwater capital projects um, with council. So for right now, we just wanted to have a, a placeholder, I guess, in the piece it, and um, we can probably have some a little bit more accurate numbers when we come back with a late study discussion. Great, thank you. Anyone else? All right, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so all said, when you look at the uh, reasonably anticipated uh, revenue assumed in the six-year tip, we're looking at about $66.1 million, and that is different than what was in the agenda bill, and that is because of the $8 million that we're now showing for the Oskos School District project. Um, so if you subtract the $8 million out, it's the um, 50, uh, 50, what is that, 54, uh, or, uh, 58. 58. Sorry, I can't do math at all. 58.1. Um, yes, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> Okay, so uh, moving on to the project. So uh, you saw a little bit of this on the spreadsheet that I was showing. Um, again, the, we're gonna start with the orange projects and uh, those are the projects that we're proposing to be funded in that six year uh, window or actually shown as having a financial commitment in that six year window. Um, short of going over and reading all of these, I'm actually gonna uh, skip over to a map, which I think is much easier to, uh, to review. And just be aware that we haven't had time to update this map to show the extents of that as possible district project, but that is something that we will uh, make sure we do in the next uh, round of this. But um, the circle projects are intersections. The uh, longer uh, lane uh, projects are the widening projects. And then we wanted to also call out that in that list that you saw on this slide, there are programs and citywide projects uh, that we listed in here. Those those do not have sites necessarily. They have many sites, I guess you could say in some cases, um, but we wanted to make sure that we listed them here so that they were still part of this uh, proposed TSIP project list. Uh, but those programs include things like, uh, you know, sidewalk projects, neighborhood CIP, street lighting, school zone safety improvements, um, ADA barrier removal, uh, pavement preservation, um, et cetera. Um, so this is the list. And of course, we can go back when the discussion starts and, and talk about specifics on here. Um, the kind of next tier of projects that we're showing on the tip is our, what we're calling our long range system completion projects. These are essentially the projects that are in the years seven through 20. They're outside the six year window. So they are essentially unfunded in that six year window. And these are the projects that for whatever reason, we don't believe that we'll uh, be getting to those uh, in that six year window um, for a variety of reasons. Um, but we wanted to make sure that they are still on the tip, that they're still shown as something that's on our radar and shown, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that sometimes you need to be responsive to changing needs. Sometimes the priorities change. Sometimes grant opportunities come up and you want to bump up a project. And that, that is totally fine. As long as we uh, go through the process, we can update our tip um, and uh, reorder everything if we need to. But it is a good idea to show these uh, for transparency purposes and uh, make sure that everyone knows what we intend to do for the long range. And these projects are shown on the map here. Um, as you can see, Sahali is on this list. Uh, that is a big project that has been uh, uh, kind of a focus for some time. Um, we also have uh, Esquapal City Road Phase 2, uh, Esquapal Pilot Road Phase 2, um, some intersection projects, as well as uh, um, reconstruction of the road of uh, Beaver Lake Drive around Beaver Lake. Um, the third component to the project list here is our regional projects. And these are really important for a variety of reasons. However, the city does not have direct control over these projects, and it makes it a little bit more complicated for making sure that these get across the finish line. Uh, projects that fall into this category are things like the um, uh, 202 Sahali Way intersection, uh, which has been studied by the state and, uh, ha however, has not been funded yet by the state. Uh, so we want to show that there. Uh, the Sound Transit North Sammamish Park and Ride lot, we left that on there even though it got delayed. It is still something that is on the radar of Sound Transit. Um, you know, it was delayed into 2045, which is, it sounds like a long way away, but Sound Transit has also said when they delayed the project that if funding came available for those types of projects that they would um, uh, elevate it. So we wanna make sure that we're not losing track of that and that it is on our list. Um, and then we have a variety of projects that are outside the city limits. Uh, these are kind of where we where we see a lot of choke points in the city. Um, as you know, 202 and Sahali is a choke point that's been there, uh, been problematic for a while. 
Uh, we also have the uh, Esquad Pami Road and uh, Esquad Fall City Road uh, kind of intersection uh, corridor project there. Um, so these are shown on the map. Uh, again, uh, the only one you actually see in the city limits is the South uh, North Sumanish Park and Ride project, which is uh, regional in nature because it serves the light rail and is a sound transit project. So just to summarize, this is what we're showing. The orange is the proposed projects to be included in that six-year window. And as you can see on this snapshot, which I know you can't read it, but um, you can kind of get the sense that we're showing the dollars by year, by fund. Um, and so making sure that it all balances out. You'll see the highlighted $8 million here. Again, we have to verify that. That was a school district project. Um, and then just for transparency purposes, we had a map that showed everything all together um, so that you could kind of get a sense of where we're showing uh, near-term and long-term projects and uh, kind of the geogra geographical distribution of projects and investments. Um, uh, so yeah, I think that is actually all the slides we have, uh, sorry, all the slides we have um, substantively. We do have a couple slides about next steps and schedule, um, but I don't know if the uh, council wants to take a break or we could do question and answer here. Uh, we're kind of flexible, so it's up to council. We did have a break right before you guys came on. I don't know if anyone has questions at this moment. I can also finish the slides and then we can open it up. Yeah, do you want Doug to finish the slides? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Okay, okay, cool. It's not too far to get across the finish line. So um, just so council is aware, we have a couple meetings planned. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks on June 7th uh, where the council will open up a public hearing and take public testimony on the TIP. And that will be very helpful in terms of informing the TIP and changes to the TIP. We will also at that time review changes that we will be making from tonight's conversation uh, to improve the draft. Uh, so you get kind of like a final-ish draft at that point. Um, and then between June 7th and June 5th, we'll take uh, you know all that input on June 7th, improve the TIP, come back on the 5th and really ask uh, council to adopt at that point in time. Once we adopt, we will send it to the state and. Um, just a little bit more detail here is um, uh, essentially, you know, what I just said. But basically, once we adopt, we'll send it to Wash as a requirement. Of the tip. So um, again, I'll leave it with council. Uh, the purpose of tonight is to really confirm and or change our both our revenue and project assumptions. Uh, so we are really excited to get some feedback tonight and um, uh, discuss this in more detail. With you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right, council. Who would like to go first? <laughs> All right, I think it's Council Member Stewart first. All right. <laughs> Just wanted to give, give everybody else a chance. Uh, thank you for that presentation. This is such an important uh, thing for us to cover. Um, so um, for the 16.9 million from the general fund, was that number just chosen to, to like balance out so that we have a, a zero difference? Is that how that number was calculated? Yeah, essentially that is the case. It was um, complementing the funding to make sure that we were able to do, for instance, the TIF projects and other projects that um, that uh, needed, for instance, sometimes for the grant grant requirements we need match. Yep. And so a lot of times we want to use the general fund for that. Okay, perfect. Just wanted to, to know if that was like a number that was backed into. Um, you made a comment that there might, or there was a comment on one of the slides that there are TIF fees that are at risk of expiring. Um, when and how much? Yeah, uh, Jeff, Jeff, go ahead, yeah. Um, the, there's a 10 year window. Oh, I looked it up today, 2013 has the oldest money in it. And there's roughly about $350,000 and it needs to be spent by 2023. And then you okay. go progressively every year after that. Um, uh, finance department keeps a table and we can share that with the council at another time. Um, there are opportunities to delay that due to, you know, for instance, COVID, some other factors that, you know, could come into play if the council wanted to take formal action. But uh, there are the, the the first money ins would be the first money outs, if you will, that yep. if you don't use them, you lose them. So how much money, so other than the 350000 in 2013, so we, do we not have $350,000 worth of TIF projects in 2023? TIF eligible uh, projects? We, we, uh, we may, we may. Uh, the, we're starting the design on, on one of the projects up at uh, Sahali Way and I can't remember the intersection there. 
Uh, two, uh, yeah, 228, that has eligible dollars that could be spent on the design. Which which uh, project is that? Um, can you give us the, the project number or it was? I, I, I don't have that table in front of me, Doug. You have that? Yeah, I can I can bring it up. It's Sahali Way and 28th intersection. It's a failing intersection in the city. It is. Um, Got it, TR 53? Uh, project TR uh, 53, yes. Okay, yes, so if that project goes forward, would it, it looks like that's only planning to spend 160,000 in 2023. So that would not take up the 350. That's correct, that's correct. So is, are there any other TIF, like, like I'm, I'm really big on not giving money back. <laughs> um, uh, sorry, sorry. So I, I think we should definitely make sure we have projects on the work plan for now and between now and 2023 that will use up all of that money. I would so I guess just so not not to belabor answer. the point, but just as a as an overall, when you come back to us with a final recommendation, that should be a, a primary goal is to make sure we're using up any TIF funds that are about to expire and that those projects are prioritized and maybe you can kind of mark them somehow so we know these are ones we probably don't want to mess with because we really need to do these so we don't give money back. Right, and if you look on the, on the um, uh, table that Doug has provided, uh, the column that has the traffic impact fee on the revenue side, there are two projects listed. Uh, and there could be another, um, and I want to explain that. Um, we do have the intersection project starting the design uh, that could spend money towards it. And then we put on hold Issaquah Pine Lake Road. We got to about 30% of the project design and put that entire project on hold. Um, and we've heard comments of equity on the south end versus the north end. We could start a, a um, TIF eligible project on Sahali Way and use those funds in the north end as well. It's not shown as such, but it could be done. Uh, so we'll need council guidance ultimately on which project to balance it to. So for, uh, if I look at this list, I only see two projects on the entire list that show as TIF eligible, TR53 and TR02, is that correct? That's correct. So I'm pretty there sure there's a, a longer there. list of projects, right? You're only showing us the ones you're recommending for the TIF. Where's the rest? Of, that was one of the questions I had. Can we get the rest of the list so we know if we needed to swap something out, we know what, what else yeah. is on our pick list? Right. The, the, the projects in green are the ones on the pick list that come from the comprehensive plan, the transportation element. And those are the longer range projects, but we could advance one of those projects that are traffic uh, fee eligible. It's about... Um, I don't remember the number, it's in the neighborhood of 75% the Sahali Way projects are eligible. Um, but again, then we would need to show how we're gonna balance those projects going forward, so. So, um, is, so this one page is the whole list of the whole universe of projects? Because I seem to recall from the past that we had like pages and pages of projects. Um, we did not include projects from the transportation master plan as that was not an adopted plan by the council. We are only using the comprehensive plan, the transportation element at this time, because that is what is adopted. That is what is in the plan itself. And the state uh, state guidelines um, require us to uh, develop a transportation improvement plan that is consistent with our comprehensive plan. Okay. All right. So, but it, so it does look in the green projects, it does look like there are a few more. Um, right. TIF eligible. So again, I would say we should definitely make sure we don't give money back. Um, uh, why? Oh, I already got that. Um, what about ARPA funding? Is that something that we can use towards road projects or is that already? Because I thought we had about 4.7, 0.6 million of ARPA funds that we still could use for various projects. Or do we already have we already like spent that three times over? <laughs> I'll defer to the uh, interim city manager for that. <laughs> thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank you, council member. Um, we do have those ARPA funds are still, we have not designated those yet. I think part of that is a broader conversation with council about how they want to use those funds. Okay. As we go into the biennial budget, one of the things we were waiting for is direction from the federal level about what we could use the funds for uh, so that we do not put ourselves in a position to have to pay them back. Uh, and then, um, 
as part of the broader biennial budget process, there are a lot of competing needs, as Jeff was pointing out, for uh, for um, capital dollars across um, more than just a transportation improvement plan. So um, yes, they're available, but there's also, as you're pointing out, they could be used three times over or more. Okay, no worries. Um, really quickly on the um, revenue assumptions, I, I asked the question and I didn't understand the answer. You're only assuming three million a year in REIT. Uh, if I went back and looked at 2019, 2020, 2021, and we were more than three million a year for uh, transportation projects for REIT, and the budgeted amount for 2022 is higher than that. So why are we only assuming three million a year for REIT? We had worked with finance on that, and one of the things that, um, uh, uh, sorry, I'm gonna navigate to a slide here real quick in one moment. Um, so yes, we worked with finance on that, and. Uh, you're right that sometimes the funding is higher, sometimes it's lower. It fluctuates pretty wildly, actually. And so if you look at back 10 years, $3, $3 million is the um, is the annual average. So when was the last um, time it was less than $3 Because I'm guessing that was back when my house was worth half of what it is today or a quarter. Here is a slide. Uh, let's see. So something that we had prepared. Um, yeah, uh, so it's been higher than three million question. since 2016. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just something to consider. I think we could maybe, you know, I don't know if we have the capacity to do more projects, but I feel like we're severely underestimating that revenue source. Uh, the other thing I'll add in there is, again, going to competing interests citywide, um, we have locked in at three million with the understanding that the council may choose to use a portion of the REIT dollars towards facility projects. Uh, that's a possibility. And so for us to claim more dollars at this time and then have to unwind that if the council chose to take a different direction is also a reason that the number is sitting at three million versus three and a half or something a little bit larger. So we wanted to be conservative and recognize that there are other competing needs throughout the city, not just transportation that might need to be addressed. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, um, and then I know I asked about the the grant funding, and I guess you said there was a, a decision made not to assume any grants we haven't already applied for. I'll defer to the council on that. Okay. I, I, yes, I, that was the that was the conservative direction given to us. A uh, couple things: D don't assume grants that you might could get because we had we had broken this up into high probability, medium probability, and fair probability or good. And the council said, no, let's not go down the good and fair. Let's just go with what you really know. And so we do, we either have application for funding or we've received funding. So we did that. And then the council told us also, please don't add new revenue sources at this time, i.e. utility taxes, um, uh, traffic, imp uh, traffic uh, benefit districts, and some other tools that are available because those might be used for operational. Who knows what the council wants to use those for in the future. And so in part to 16.9, when we tried to balance it, because you also told us spend those traffic impact fees, what was left is the one-time monies that are left over in the ending fund balance would need to be used to balance you know, that one big project. Okay, so if we did get more grants, we would just put it back into the general fund. Okay, because I feel like assuming no grants in like years four, you know, three through six is a probably not a great assumption. All right, um, that was it for my, oh, the other one for the revenue assumptions is, um, and I asked about this, I think you said you're gonna recalculate it, is the number of multifamily units of 50 no, per not. year. That I don't think that pencils in with even what's in the pipeline, but I'm not sure. Uh, according that, to, that, yeah, go ahead, Doug. Oh, sorry, Doug. Um, that, that is our pipeline. That, those are our pipeline numbers. Um, we uh, work with DCD on those, and there are some really clear parameters on that, which is um, complete application in the preliminary review process all the way through final recording of a plat. Um, so that captures everything in the six-year window, and uh, those are actually pretty hard numbers. Uh, but that's just part. what's, so if somebody came in tomorrow, those numbers would go up. Um, yeah, and we would we, we could adjust if we need to, but um, okay. those are what we're assuming. Because there's also a, a couple external factors going on, which is that impact fees are paid 
Uh, it, again, some inside baseball here, but impact fees are paid in varying different points in the process, depending on the type of application and the developer, et cetera. There are things that the state allows uh, called uh, impact fee deferrals. Um, so a develop, developer can choose to defer it. Um, there are all kinds of external market factors going on where sometimes projects get started and they stall out, um, you know, a whole bunch of things. So we're trying to do uh, the best with the data that we have. And the best data we have right now is the 50, 50 MFR multifamily residential units um, annualized uh, over the six years and then 35 single family residential. Okay. All right. Um, and then the only other big question I had was um, around, and I think a number of people have asked about this, the pavement preservation street oh. reconstruction of a million a year. That seems kind of high. I know we have like the, the worst street in Sammamish that we're working on right now, but won't most of the other ones be handled through our um, overlay project? Doug, if I may. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, I did send out to the city council today a clip from a, a spreadsheet that we sent out to the council last fall regarding this issue. And so for the newbies, you hadn't seen that. But there are 20 some streets that are 45 or 30, that the score of 45 or 30 or worse in the city system. And those streets are at risk of becoming another shore lane. So those that have the opportunity to go and visit shore lane, um, I, I know that. Uh, Deputy Mayor Clark, uh, you and I had a conversation about that and you had an opportunity to go out and witness that street. We have many streets in the city that are beginning to approach that. And so it was our recommendation to come with a new capital program that we begin to address those and get those failing streets back into normal operating mode. Um, because if you don't, you're gonna pay more. And right. You're gonna pay so more due to failing. So we want to, we want to suggest addressing those sooner than later and that is a, a bucket of money that's different than the operating annual paving program. So it is a different thing. So one is operating for overlays and one is capital for road reconstruction. So these are these are roads that the overlay won't work anymore. So we have that's to That's correct. We have to, okay. So shouldn't those roads just be on here as projects and not just a bucket? Because if well, they need to be fixed, don't they just need to be called out? Uh, we, we haven't had the opportunity to come back to council with the specifics of the projects, what level of funding. Um, the spreadsheet that I sent out today shows in the neighborhood of a mil, uh, $6 million to do most of those projects. Of course, there's inflation and it isn't a complete project cost. So we have not had the opportunity to do a full briefing with the council. So we put a placeholder in there of a million dollars annually in the tip. Of course, we can change that by the time we get to the hearing, but at least it's a placeholder for discussion. Okay, great. And then I won't belabor any of the projects or the, the priorities of them, but I did ask if we could get with this list of projects, the prioritization math that you did, so we can kind of see the ones that are on the margin. So if we do need to start playing a little bit of a shell game with TIF funds or something like that, it'd be great to see what that came out. Is that something you could send to us? Uh, yeah, Absolutely. we'll, yeah. yeah, we do okay. have that. Um, and, and we do plan, and another piece of the puzzle here is we do plan to come back to the council uh, sooner than later on the traffic impact fee program. We had originally were holding off doing an update subject to the outcome of the Bluma and the code and comp plan amendments because those would have generated, you know, alternative four generated almost $380 million worth of improvements and deficiencies. Now that that's come off the table, uh, the list of, of TIF eligible project goes back to 2014. And it is that list of projects that's in the comprehensive plan that needs to be reevaluated to see, can we make any adjustments? We may not be able to make any adjustments regardless. So um, we do need to come back to the council and see what, what we can do with the TIF. Great, and I know interim city manager, you had a, a couple things. I don't know if you wanna go, sorry. Uh, really quickly, and then I will defer to Councilmember Howe. Um, I just want to reiterate, um, the team is doing a great job and we're, we're getting down into the weeds a little bit more. I just want to remind Council that because this is a planning document, that this allows us to update as we know more. Uh, if we get grants in, we can update the plan. Um, this, this can be updated as we go, as opposed to something that's more substantive that once we lock it in, it's there for a few years. So again, this is a, I would call this, and Doug and Jeff can kick me under the proverbial table if I'm going a little far here, but it's more of a living document that allows us to 
to help prioritize and give the team direction on how to move forward, but essentially up front with our biennial budget process to say, what are we going to spend money on? Can we spend money? And what are we going to spend it on coming up here? And then how do we plan for moving forward? And so um, these are all great questions. I just want to remind council that we do have more than one bite of the apple as we get more, um, as we learn more, as the projects Jeff was describing, if we get more farther down the road, we can start to call those out differently. So there's a lot of options for council as we move forward in this process. Scott, can I add to that? Yeah, um, Scott's absolutely right that uh, we can we can update this as many times as we want. The only thing I would add is that there's a process step, which is that you must hold a public hearing before you readopt the tip. So, um, just want to clarify this for. And, and just real quick before Karen Howe goes, I, I'm sorry, Karen, but I do want to add um, uh, on behalf of uh, Mayor Malchow, while it is a planning document, it does create an obligation of intent to do something with your first two years really being your 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 budget. You know, it informs the budget for the first two years, ideally. Again, it can change. You can, you know, we get the budget, you can swipe it off and say no, technically, but it is meant to obligate and inform. So I just wanted to do that. Now, back to Kaylee to give it to Karen. Yeah, would anyone else like to go before? Oh. Just kidding, okay. <laughs> Council Member Howe. <laughs> And here I was going to compliment you guys. Jeez, the and and say that I completely agreed actually with conservative numbers. Thank you for taking to heart everything that we'd said in a prior meeting about being conservative with the numbers, because we do know that there are going to be cost overruns that are unanticipated that are going to nail us at some point. My question actually has to do a bit with the future. How do we? Maximize the opportunity with the public hearing so that you're able to get the feedback and the con connection to residents that you need in order to feel like you've got input that's meaningful and useful? Uh, that, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so the reason why we're holding it on the 7th is that it does give us time to adjust and rerun the numbers, rebalance it. So I, I do feel comfortable that we do have time to incorporate everything. Um, I think the important thing that we are always seeking from council is concurrence in the, in the sense of majority concurrence. Um, so while the public input is, is excellent and needed in this, we still do want council to um, be telling us uh, their concurrence on all the changes we're making to the tip. So um, that is the kind of uh, additional point to that. But I do think um, by holding the public hearing, we've already been receiving some emails and commentary, and there's actually been a lot of interest in the tip this year. Uh, we've sent, I've sent it out personally to a few people who have requested it via the not notification they got. Um, so uh, yeah, absolutely, there's, it's already in progress. So that's the good thing is that, you know, tonight we heard a lot of input. And just by way of example, you know, we heard that the Esplos School District project was missing from the tip and we added that. Granted, it was uh, on the fly, so we have, you know, some rebalancing we need to do on that uh, in terms of verifying the numbers. Um, but we do take the public input very seriously. and. Um, uh, but also, we want to make sure that we have constant concurrence on any changes. Thank you. I would also, I would also offer uh, Council Member Howe, um, wh while the public may want things, the hard part is, is, and we can identify what they want, the policy guidance comes from the Council to tell us what you can afford or willing to afford. And so, um, we don't ask that question of the public um, necessarily, what are you, you know, how are you willing to pay for it? other than what is here on the document as proposed. We're showing you a proposed plan that is balanced, that can be changed. But if we want new things or different things or more things, the challenge is gonna be is where does the money come from? Does it come from taking away something or adding something, i.e. revenues or taking away projects? We're, we're dealing with that issue right now, just on the traffic impact fee project. We have two and maybe a third, um, you know, how do we balance that? And how do we get that, you know, input from the, the the community, I don't know that they get that granular with it. But we, we do take their input. And again, we'll be coming back to say, how do we counsel? What's your what's your comfort level for balancing the revenue? Well, and you guys did such a great job, I thought, with the way that you constructed your visual argument over um, uh, 212th when, when you were giving options to residents. And I think a little bit maybe to Council Member Stewart's point when she was talking about a map with everything on it and prioritized and maybe with price tags. 
attached to so that we understand, so that we as a collective, you know, not separate, council member resident, but as a collective understand these are the priorities, these are what what we think are, are important and, and for safety reasons and, for, and actually listing why these are first. I mean, there a big piece I think that's missing for people is, well, why did you do that? The why part. And that's on us. I think that's on the council to help for, to provide that why and, and, and organized in a way that it's digestible by people. One of the things that we've tried to do is in the table of information to the very far left is some qualifier information about the projects. But really to start off with the list of the projects, the first three are level of service projects. These are the intersection projects that must be done, right? And then the school district project is in there because that's imminent, or at least we believe it to be the case. And then the next project on the list is ADA. That's a federal mandate. You've already committed to do that. It's actually a new program since the, uh, uh, the, the capital facilities plan was adopted um, that the council two years ago said, yep, we need to do that. And so we, we have the whys for each one of those projects, and then we run out of money, you know, pretty quickly. So that, they're, that's what we're dealing with. And every one of those projects has, has got a story as to why it's on there. And, and we'll endeavor to tell that story when we make the presentation or through the presentation materials. Uh, that's our, our job to attempt to do so. So hopefully that helps. Great, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Lamb. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for um, answering our questions by email earlier today. Um, that was really quick turnaround. Um, I just had one more question, and that um, is regarding the Bluma EIS. Um, now that we're not implementing V over C, did that change the order of the road projects? Like, were they reordered in any way, or um, maybe you answered it and I just didn't hear? Uh, yeah, do you want to take, take a stab or would you like me to go ahead? Yeah, I can, I can take a stab. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Lamb. Uh, good question. So one of the things that we had been doing, and actually it dates back to our TIP effort last year, um, when Bluma, the Bluma EIS was kind of just in the middle of that, that process, we decided to withhold those projects on the EIS uh, pending the process. We wanted the process to play out first, uh, go through the EIS, issue the final EIS, and then uh, after that, after we made the code and plot plan amendments, we would uh, we had committed to putting those projects into the tip at that time. We wanted to make sure they were, you know, real projects that we were pursuing based on a standard that was adopted. So because the the standards were not adopted, we do not have those projects. We did not have those projects on there. We were uh, I don't know if you recall from earlier conversations in this, but we wanted to do kind of a two part process where we had done the tip based on the standards in place today. And then once the EIS and VOC standards were adopted, we would have uh, updated the TIP to include those projects. So because we did it that, that way, we don't have to make changes now, and those projects were not in the list already. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Looks like Jeff has something additional to add to that. Okay. If, if Council Member Lamb is happy with your answer, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Well, so I do see like Sahali Way. I know there was um, like the widening to five lanes and I still see that on there. So yeah. maybe there's some clarity there. Yeah, let me, yeah, let me, help, yeah. let me help with you. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, go ahead. Go um, ahead. Part, well, the answer that I was gonna help add to that was is that if we were coming back with the with the code and comp plan and the, and, the, and the alternative four projects, we would have also come with a major financing plan and a time frame for that financing plan and an opportunity to reevaluate each of the corridors by standards to see how much we could actually build and need to build. We're not doing those things now because we've, we've you know, revoked uh, you know, that piece of work. Uh, so the, the Sahali projects are still on there because they are necessary uh, system completion projects uh, that are in the current comp plan. So again, we, we have a need to update the comprehensive plan. The last one was 2015 those projects um, are on those lists and that's our foundation at the moment. Got it, thank you. You bet. All right, Council Member Moran. Okay, um, I have got, I think I've got it narrowed down to just a few. So without the B over C, um, I've got questions on the Issaquah Falls City Road 
and also the Issaquah Pine Lake Road. I would understand the intersection that is by the fire station and the school. Yeah, the roundabout. You want me to speak to that one first? You take your pick. Uh, the the we, we throw it, we are suggesting a study, a restudy, or an additional study of the intersection of Issaquah Pine Lake Road and 32nd, which is north of the fire station and south of the school, based on our assessment of school back in session and the the incredible amount of traffic that happens at peaking times. Um, while the roundabout was studied and was going to be implemented as a part of the Issaquah Pine Lake Road corridor project, phase one, we're not, we were not certain if that project is going forward and when. However, with the school backup happening in the morning and in the evening, we believe it's imperative to take a look at doing a, a signalized roundabout whereby uh, during peak times or when there's a call for an emergency vehicle that the legs of the approaches can be stopped so that the fire vehicle can get through the intersection more safely, more effectively. So we wanna study that. It's a common thing now to signalize roundabouts for peaking operations, such as schools, such as freeway operations. Washdot's got several of them in play. You go to Carmel, Indiana, the, the roundabout capital of the world online, they have over 210 roundabouts in their community. And many of them, they are doing signalized roundabouts to deal with the peak. Putting in a signal for $500,000 or a million dollars is a whole lot cheaper than ripping out that entire intersection and putting it back to a signal for marginal you know, gain because a roundabout is much more safer at any time other than peaking than a signal is. Um, so anyway, that's the purpose of that is to, uh, we'd like to study that and see what the results are and what could be implemented sooner than later um, as a possibility. Okay, and, and then, then you the Issaquah Fall City, is that road, uh, with taking away the V over C, that road shouldn't oh. be failing. That's correct. If you, Issaquah Fall City Road phase one and two was a corridor project. Those do not need to go forward now because we've suspended or revoked, whatever the terminology is. Um, and so therefore, but we had, we've collected traffic impact fees associated with it. And so if we're not going to spend our traffic impact fee dollars on that project, which is still el eligible based on the current 2014 study, then we would need to probably move that to a Sahali project, which is eligible for traffic impact fees and begin starting you know, to start that. Okay. Uh, so, so you got trade-offs, right. trade-offs. And, and keep in mind, it seems like every one of those corridors are 20 to $30 million, you know, a half mile and Sahali Way was last listed nearly a hundred million dollars. So if we're going to talk about Sahali Way and want to advance that as a project, which segment, right? Because right. I don't think you want to commit right up front $25 million of general fund money unless you want to raise new taxes or new fees to offset the um, traffic impact fees that need to be spent with that. So again, just these are these are variables. Okay, yeah, because I, I mean, I don't think there was ever I've never seen a design for five lanes that I, I mean, I've never, I don't think I've ever seen a design for five lanes. So, um, but I know that there was different ideas on, on how to make that traffic flow um, right. much better taking it to two to two. So, so what could happen is, is that this, the city, if they wanted to, this goes to council member Stewart's question, let's not leave any money on the table. We could do a corridor reassessment in, uh, and assuming V over C is not on the table anymore, but what what should the court what should the system completion for 228th and Sahali be without V over C? That is a what I believe to be a, a traffic impact fee eligible project at this time, um, and we should you know possibly consider doing that. And does that um, would that include like uh, flexible? design standards and that sort of yeah. thing? Yeah, you would look at the whole corridor and then break it up into bite-sized achievable pieces. It's a complete streets approach, but maybe we do, you know, kind of like uh, Lewis Thompson Road. We, we, have it, we have a city standard that says, this is what we're supposed to do, but what do we want to do? What do we need right. to do? What's the best thing at what location? Um, for safety reasons, for transit, for, you know, pedestrians, all those kinds of things. And it may be a much lesser project 
than $100 million. I can't answer that right now, but that's a, that's a plausibility. Okay, and then um, I've got two other questions. Um, the other question I have is, in taking away the V over C, um, we've got, and just having, we're back to the intersection level of service, on two of our main commute roads on the north end, mm -hmm. we have no way to measure traffic. So now we're out of, we're out of um, what the GMA says to do, because we're supposed to measure it. So how are we going to do that? That is a great question, and I today do not have an answer because the council has taken direction, um, and we would need to talk with our consultants on how best to come back with a strategy or a series of possible solutions, but if tonight we don't have an answer to that specific question. So we, we, so we canceled a way to get answers, but yet we went forward with, I, I'm just trying in my mind to figure yeah. out we don't have an answer on how we're going to how we're going to be in compliance with the GMA on that. Okay. Um, so. Okay. Uh, the Doug, next. Doug, Doug, did I miss anything in that answer? Maybe you have some more that you could add for a council. Yeah, and, and I'd, I'd like to just clarify: is the question more that we we track those intersections and those choke points? Is that is that the question, or is it? Because you're saying measuring measuring uh, so traffic. Still, yeah, so we need to be we need to be measuring according to the GMA. We need to be measuring the traffic on those roads, and I don't know how we're going to do it if we're going to be doing level of service solely level of service because uh, we don't have intersections on those roadways. So there's got to be another way that we're going to have to come up with to measure the traffic on those roadways um, because those are two very important roadways that we have commuters take and frankly those are our exits out of the north end in an emergency so we need to know what that traffic is yeah so um I, i'm not a modeler but i have spoken with uh, our modeling team and um so those intersections are part of our model and we do track those uh, but when you're talking about the capacity for the oversee uh, without that standard we do not uh assess those for pass fail if that makes sense um and and those are intersections are outside of the city boundaries so um you know the east lake Sammamish parkway and, and 202 is redmond and 202 sahali is, is um uh, the state slash king county so um you know those, those that plays into it as well but those intersections are modeled as part of it they, they are included in our model right so but they it still doesn't tell us it doesn't answer our question basically it doesn't we're not measuring it we're not we're not um able to keep track of what those numbers are we're not able to measure them as we do and keep track of the numbers on the other roadways uh, other than doing you know mid mid segment traffic counts and then assessing what that's telling us um I, again i would want to bring our traffic consultant from you know, victor in and have a dialogue and discussion about what could we do? You know, now that we've taken V over C away, what are, you know, plausible good. solutions? Uh, and that just because this action happened just within the last three or four weeks, we're not we've not had a chance to meet with Victor or bring him to the table to begin this dialogue. But your point is well taken. Okay. Um, and then the other thing is um, one of the things that I didn't see us get this time, and I've, I've tried to bring in the last three years that I had is. Um, I've always seen a list of our sidewalk priorities. So for, so, you know, we would have, this is how much we're gonna do, and here's our list of where we are on our sidewalk priorities. And my concern with that is, is that if we're going to start, you know, willy-nilly putting sidewalks where we kind of wanna put them versus where we probably should put them, which is around the schools and that sort of thing, then, um, we're probably not utilizing the fund to the best uh, that we should be as far as safety and best for the uh, citizens. So I'm just wondering what happened or do we still have or are we still doing it that way or what's going on with the sidewalk fund and list that had been originated? You can take a stab at that and Jeff, uh, you know, you can jump in if you, if you need to, but 
Um, yeah, sidewalk priorities is something that we don't currently have. Uh, we did take a stab at that under the draft TMP, but that was uh, not adopted. So in the absence of something, you know, prioritized like that, we, we do not have um, a list today that is prioritized. Um, but that's something that we want to work on, especially as we uh, undertake the 2024 comp plan update. I think mean, that is something that we can build into that and should build into that. Um, but yeah, I don't know, Jeff, if you want to add to that. Uh, no, I think you you hit the nail on the head is we we attempted it under the TMP and then we put the this tip on hold for the past two years or three years. And consequently, we, we looked at one project to fill a gap, which was Inglewood Hill Road between 213th and the roundabout. That's a project that we started, so to speak. Um, although given what we the decision made on on Lewis Thompson Road to add three million dollars. I'm, you know, we need to figure out, okay, now where's the money going to come from to do sidewalk projects, you know, because they run in the neighborhood now seven, $750,000 or more, depending upon the length of the project. So, uh, but we do not have a list at this point in time. We have a program and we have come back with the council to figure out that, but we don't have it vested or defined today the way that you're thinking about it, at least to, to my understanding. Okay, so my concern with that is that in our comp plan, you know, one of the things that we talk about are, is that, you know, our schools and safe walking routes and that sort of thing, then if we're going to ask kids to walk to school, then we had better make it safe for them to walk to school. So that is why it has always been the school, you know, walking routes were always the number one priority for sidewalks. So I'm... I, at least I feel very strong about the fact that, you know, especially when I hear that we've got principals saying it's not safe for you to walk someplace, that we really need to go, right. you know, back to, you know, draw that circle around that school and make sure that those are in place first before right. we start putting stuff other places. Uh, one thing I'll add, and it's, it's Except a great in point front of my neighborhood because I want my sidewalk, but never mind that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but let Just me add, because um, it sparked a, a, a thought there. <clears throat> we have been short, uh, short staff. We, we, in our public works department, are, are uh, four vacancies that are open. Um, and so consequently, we've also not had the ability to uh, do the assessment that you're talking about. I, I, I firmly believe that the city ought to do a system completion program. And one of the elements of that is starting with your schools and doing a mile radius out, every one of them, and figuring out where the gaps are for either bike lanes and or sidewalks. I, but I've had to rebuild our, our traffic division with the exception of one person when I came on board, they all left and then we, we spent a year and a half trying to rebuild that department. And I'm still down one person to be able to take on that particular develop that. Um, Linda, our uh, traffic uh, manager, is developing plans and putting them on the shelf for us, but she needs staffing and resources to help get there, and we're just, we're missing that. We plan to do it, but we're just, we don't have it to that level at this point in time. Okay, well, you've done a great job, by the way. Um, okay, I think that, I think that's all I have for now, but thank you. All right, uh, Council Member Treen. So Jeff, keep you on the hot seat here for just a second. In uh, system completions, I agree with uh, the direction that Karen Moran was talking about with the schools, uh, about sidewalks, the one mile uh, distance. Uh, definitely wanna encourage uh, the bike lanes as well though. And so I'll just double emphasize that. When you talk about system completions, uh, and I look at the big dollars for Sahali Way as an example, uh, since that those projects are gonna be on the, on the TCIP because of concurrency issues. Uh, is Sahali, uh, or 202 in Sahali, is that a system completion project? In my opinion, um, you know, and Doug, maybe you can, you know, pipe in after me here. Uh, as you know, when Sahali, excuse me, when Sammamish was incorporated, they took over the county infrastructure and the county built many, if not most of all the streets to a rural standard, um, i.e. we don't have curb gutter, sidewalk and bike lanes on most of our arterials. And it's been a constant battle for the city for the past 20 years as we've grown up 
um, to try to figure out how to do that. And the city's taken some great steps. Uh, 228, you know, in the heart of the city is a beautiful project, uh, you know, that got built. It's got a, you know, a, a shared bike lane on one side and, you know, um, buffered, you know, bikeways and all those kinds of things. And the city has taken those steps. Going to your point, for projects that are slightly outside of the city, like SR202 and Sahali Way, it is a critical project to the city of Sammamish because all of us have to drive through it, even though it's technically outside our or, you know, our jurisdiction. To solve that problem, it will require bold leadership by the city to maybe become the leader of that project through interlocal agreements to inspire that project to go forward. When I think of system completion, I'm thinking one of two strategies. Start on your end, your choke points, and work your way in, i.e., you got the north end and the south end. Victor's talked about those, our traffic yeah. engineer, that need to be fixed, um, and then work your way in, so to speak, or start at the heart of the city and work your way out. I, I think that the bulk of the citizens of Sammamish would prefer to get those two choke points fixed and fixed as soon as possible. Challenge is it's outside of the city. How do you inspire King County and or WashDOT to, to fix the those? Well, you, you take them over. You, 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 tell, you bring them to the table and say, we'll bring money to the table. We'll bring the consultants. Just work with us to get there. And then all of a sudden, things start to happen. I say that from a voice of experience because we did that in Linwood in a corridor project with Snohomish County. But anyway, I digress on that component. So, so the second thing then, because I, I look at it on um, multiple levels, yep. uh, regionally, I mean, 2024, light rail's coming into Redmond. Uh, so why we're not jumping... Okay, my opinion is I think we... Sh if, if system completion is the way we go uh, for this TCIP, then in 2024, light rail... And if I want to reduce congestion or remove cars from the roadway, then hooking up to light rail, that, that intersection may solve... Uh, a myriad of challenges just by improving the that signal down there at the bottom of the hill so my my direction would be that that would be the starting point and then i would say then if you move your map down a little bit is is that bottom project that t tr you can call it tr03 and tr27 that, that's the south end. So at some point here, 2035, 2041, uh, light rail's coming to Issaquah. And so th there's, there's your second one. Uh, maybe it's not in this next six years, but that puts us at 2028. So why don't we get ahead of the game for the first time instead of being behind the game and start working that problem there? Because our other challenge is this and I'm thankful for the eight million dollars from the school district but the other challenge is this 228 the southeast 43rd and clearly at least in depending on how they allow this where the students are going to come from to go to those schools that is that um, is a Pine Lake intersection becomes a, a mess Right. If, I mean, and you got to fix it. So again, then why why would we be behind the eight ball again? Why don't we be proactive and and work that intersection? Because what you're doing then by doing even those three projects or working on these three um, I call them the choke points, these three exit points off of the city, you literally are helping all the residents of Sammamish. So, okay, off my soapbox. The last question is, um, East Lake Sammamish Parkway, what, what, is, what is the solution? Because there's our other uh, avenues of um, getting people in and out of the city, moving people. Um, how, how do we measure that? Doug, you want to take a stab or would you like me to? Um, sure, I can take a stab. Um, so the parkway is obviously very problematic for a myriad reasons. Um, and it's something that we did look at in the EIS. I know that that's, uh, you know, not something we're currently pursuing, but um, the EIS did uh, look into that. And one of the problems that you run into with the parkway is 
Um, if you improve the parkway, it, it effectively attracts more traffic. So if you build it, it will come, that kind of idea. And it is currently a minor arterial in the city. So the idea behind Alternative 4, which, you know, not to rehash a lot of the history, but the idea behind Alternative 4 in the EIS was that we would build the city's principal arterials to the standard, the principal arterial standard, and that would attract traffic to the, the, the roads that were classified to carry the heaviest volumes at the peak hour. Uh, and, and in theory, that would take traffic off of the East Lake Park. Park. Um, that, that obviously has a lot of cost behind it, um, but it does kind of get at that system completion idea, which uh, I know you were asking about a few minutes ago, um, which, you know, you're kind of taking the, the rural roads, those roads that were built by the county years ago, and making them more urban in nature and, and accommodating the, the volumes that we do see, which are essentially urban uh, volumes. And so um, that was really the, the trick there with uh, the parkway. It's, it's a tough one, um, and it's extremely costly. Any project you do on the parkway, uh, not only just for uh, geological reasons and you know landslide hazards and wetlands and creeks and, and wildlife and all the stuff that's uh, adjacent to the parkway, um, you know the cost of the property there, right of way acquisition for a linear project of that nature is astronomically expensive, and so. Um, the parkway is a really tricky one for the city. Um, so I think, you know, going back to the EIS, I think that's why uh, Alternative 4 resonated with the council. In, in my opinion, you know, again, going back to December, so maybe memory is a little bit hazy, but um, I do think the idea of building your roads to the standards that they are supposed to be um, to draw the traffic to the areas where the, the traffic is meant to be was appealing. So that, that was um, uh, kind of the trick there, or the, the, the rub, I guess you would say. The other thing that I would add in terms of solution to Council Member Treen's question is if we're not going to build to our standards, then the next level of, of management is access management. And what I mean by access management, what's causing congestion are the left turners to their driveways, um, you know, in the corridor. We talked about this last year with Issaquah Fall City Road Phase 2. The challenge with that project is we could build it to standard is that it was multi-millions of dollars or we could look at doing access management. What that means is, is you cut off the left turn, but you put roundabouts at strategic locations in the corridor. So yes, you have to go past your house and maybe a quarter of a mile to half a mile, then you have a U-turn to come back to make that work. It's a safe, effective way of managing access and you're not building out the infrastructure to the, you know, to the degree, but we would have to study that. Where and how could we do that versus, um, you know, the standard, I, I think, I think the parkway is a good candidate for that. I think um, Issaquah Falls City Road Phase Two is a, and going out Duthie Hill Road is a candidate for that because your your congestion comes from people turning left. You know they're they're stopping and trying to get home or they're trying to get out of their driveway, you know, and waiting for that gap. So to answer your question, some more studies, but you're if you're not going to build to the standard, then let's look at access management as your next mm -hmm. tool. And last thing is the. Um... Um, stormwater projects, yeah. Let's. Uh, I'm. A, I'm a all go on those. Uh, uh, the Duthie Hill section there, and the one by the elementary school, and the. Um, oh, I'm drawing a blank where the other one is. Uh, it's two twelve between. Two tw yeah, two twelve. So thank you, thank you for all your guys' work. All right, uh, Council Member Stewart. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, one question, and, and I don't know if this is for you, Jeff, or maybe you, Scott, is um, as we're working on the comp plan update, when is the right time to do the TMP? Do we need to get back on and get the TMP done now, or can we do it, can we give direction to do that as part of the comp plan update? Because what I hear, all of this stuff, everything I keep hearing, is we need the TMP, and if only we had the TMP, we'd know how to do the system completion. We would, you know, we would know what studies to go do. We'd even know what priority order to work on it in. We'd know how to prioritize our sidewalk gap projects, those types of things. So what's the best way for us to help you guys help us? <laughs> uh, Jeff has a good stump speech on this one, so I'm gonna turn it over to him. Excellent. <clears throat> really Let's quickly it, and let him uh, take this one on. Well, um, I'm going to go back to, uh, I disagree that we need a TMP at the moment. 
Um, I think it, not knowing what's going to come out of the comp plan over the next two years, I would not want to invest yet money into updating a TMP until I knew what, what was going to come out of or be a part of uh, the comprehensive plan update. So I would suggest that we postpone, although we can start and restart again. Um, the challenge with the TNP, as I understood it, for not going forward, is it was somewhat of a wish list, and it was somewhat of a, a I mean, I heard different things about it from different people. Yeah, let's have, not rehash history. Let's figure out what we need to do going forward. Right. But what we do, what I believe we need to do is a system completion approach um, and, and put that into our transportation element going forward and, and focus our energies on that as opposed to trying to unravel or redo a TNP that the council chose not to want to go forward with. Um, but if the council chooses to want to go forward with the TNP, then we, you know, I, I hadn't contemplated that actually as being a possibility to be straight up with you. Um, and so that's new territory for me to want to consider um, at this point in time. But I think a system completion approach for the transportation element is the right approach to do. And we can pick off four or five components of that, do the assessments associated with that. And, and does that address in. all of the multimodal and all of the other parts as well? And transit? I believe, I, I, if, if we're going to build out our system, then yes, I believe it does that. Okay. Um, and then that leads me to the other question, Scott, is I know you guys are working on it, but when will we see um, the information about the transit, because I think that has a huge impact on which projects we prioritize here. Doug, you want to, well, go ahead, Scott. No, no, I was just gonna say, I, I know Doug has an update on this, and I know that there's a uh, information in the in the waiting, so Doug. Yeah, um, so this one has been on uh, my list to do for a little while now. Uh, we have done, made some progress, um, and, it kind of, you know, there's the intersection with the Bloom EIS uh, work, which we are coming back uh, to council on the 7th of June to kind of clarify and, and just make sure we're on the right track for that project. So I think at that point, we'll have more information about, um, uh, you know, the approach with uh, looking at transit. Um, one of my tasks, uh, once I can get past a few of these uh, tip related tasks is to um, sit down and write the memo to council about uh, where we're at with the transit uh, um, uh, work that we're directed to do. One of the things that uh, we're going to be suggesting is a transit study, and we've talked a little bit about this in the past. But the idea there is that we need to know we need to know the problem, how big the problem is, and what the opportunity is too, in order to be able to effectively move forward on working with Metro about potentially buying service um, or otherwise improving service to the city. Um, there's a couple parallel things going on, and I, I think I mentioned last time we talked about um, something called the East Link Connections Partnership that Metro and Sound Transit are undertaking right now to restructure service yep. once the light rail comes online on the east side. Um, so there are some changes coming from that. So we're trying to, you know, just get our heads wrapped around that and uh, make sure we're communicating with council on that as well. So forthcoming, I do apologize, it has taken some time, but we've had uh, a lot going on. In no, totally. I, I just feel like before we kind of lock in on certain road projects, it would be good to know if that's, you know, just to have that information as part of the equation. So appreciate Absolutely. that, Doug. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. And then um, a couple of projects that I do think maybe we should consider adding to the list. Uh, TR04, um, if I understand that, isn't that that intersection isn't, I wanna say that um, that, that uh, was deemed a bit of a safety issue because it's really, isn't that the one where you come down the hill and then you turn onto the parkway, that intersection? Yes. <clears throat> yeah. That is a, yes, that's correct. That is a, it used to be a failure. Uh, it used to not meet our intersection standards, uh, but uh, it actually does meet the standards now. Um, so it is a project that had been on the list for quite some time. Um, and it's it's a relatively straightforward uh, project in my assessment. Um, I don't know if maybe Jeff Rodriguez has a different assessment of it, but I, I do think it's just some intersection improvements, uh, mini roundabout. Uh, so anyway, yeah, that, that has been on the list for a little while. I, I wouldn't mind seeing that one, and actually the one below it, TR61. Is, is TR61, is that, um, is that the crest? That's actually the intersection where the Northeast Sammamish Water District is. Oh, Jeff sorry. Were, Jeff, Jeff, I and Audrey were just talking yep. about this. And this okay. one actually needs to come off the list 
Got it. Um, okay. Because we have a solution that is not a signal solution. Got it. So. Is the crest is an intersection or an improvement at the entrance to the crest? Is that on this list? The Pacific Crest is that the? the no, it's the, just called the crest. It's like there's a um, uh, Heritage Hills and. The neighborhood called oh, right. I think it is on the list. It is. Because that's been one that's been problematic for a while. It's 30 something. Yeah. I think we need to look into that one. Um, I'll, I'll put that on the list to, to look into for some purpose. Okay, yeah, if you could, the, the one I think, Karen, you're thinking of is the Southeast 40th. That's the one down at Sammamish Highlands on the south end. Um, yeah, I I think that one at the intersection because there's a, a Saha or there's a Heritage Hills and the Crest uh, kind of cross there, and um, I would agree that like there may be other long term things we're doing, but that may be one where, you know, a a, a signal might be appropriate in the interim um, given the the challenges because it's a blind hill there, and my understanding is that. Most of the time people come flying over that hill. So if you're trying to come out of the crest and make a left-hand turn, or if you're trying to come out of Heritage Hills and make a left-hand turn, it can get a little dicey when people are kind of flying at about 55 up over that hill. So um, those would be two that I wouldn't mind seeing, maybe move up on the list and seeing if we can find some revenue sources to cover those. Um, and then- well, Oh. When you say revenue sources, do you have suggested revenue sources or are you suggesting staff uh, use our magic wand and try to find, you know, a different combination? Or? Hey, if you have a magic wand, Jeff, then always use the magic wand. But I'm just saying that, like, if you're trying to balance it and you add those projects and it doesn't balance, then, then you know, if you need our help, like, you got to tell us what, you know, if we got to make some tough decision somewhere or whatever. So that's all oh, I was saying is okay. but magic wands are always appreciated. Right. Um, and then I just had, a, I, I, I hate to ask this, I know you tried to answer it in, in email um, and, and uh, Councilman Moran asked about it, but the, the roundabout in front of the fire station, isn't that the one where they did the really cool modeling for us where we like drove down the road, right? And they did all the modeling to turn that roundabout into um, uh, a, a signal. And were you saying, Jeff, that you don't think we should make it a signal? You think we should try to make it a signaled roundabout? Because I thought when they did that modeling, one of the challenges, yes. even making that bigger, is it's really tough for the fire trucks to get around the roundabout. And so they had done quite a bit of study on making that roundabout bigger versus making it a signal and had concluded that a signal was really the best. And we got to see, they did really cool. Remember that video? And it was like we were driving down the road and they showed all the modeling. So I'm just curious what, what additional modeling we need to do there. Cause I, I, I thought that one was kind of like ready for design. Yeah, so what happened was is as we uh, took tra additional traffic counts and we had uh, Victor Salman take a look at uh, the traffic counts that were occurring there, the roundabout um, and as it was proposed to be redesigned wasn't working properly in the computer models. And it was puzzling us for quite some time. And there are different modifications to the roundabout that need to occur. And we are looking at, if you're gonna spend a whole bunch of money, I think there's more cost-effective solutions. And so I want to explore those first, i.e. a signalized roundabout, before we embark upon ripping the entire intersection out for multi-millions of dollars um, and putting back a signal because a roundabout has eight conflict points for accidents versus a signal that has 32 points for accidents. And so before we do that, I want to be I want to be sure. I want to dot the i's and cross the t's and double check and see if there's another another option um, that we can explore. And it's okay. based on the input of the traffic counts and our current traffic engineer consultant engineer. And speaking of traffic counts, can we get those? We're working on them. Um, we're, we, just, uh, we just received those. Uh, we're in the process of doing QAQC on those. It will be a few weeks out before they're available for distribution. At least a few weeks, it could be longer. Again, I'm, I'm short staffed in my traffic division and trying to fit the QAQ, QAQC work in, but uh, we'll get those to you as soon as they're available. 
Okay, I'll go really fast here. Um, why is the Public Works Trust Fund loan repayment still on there when I think it's already repaid? Uh, because the comprehensive plan uh, for 2015 had it as a project. We just paid it off and it does need to come off the list. Okay, perfect. So it's a great question, but it was there before, and now we're going to take it off. Okay, and then, um, and I think this is kind of adding on to Councilmember Moran's question. There are a list of projects that don't have funding. The sidewalks, the intersection and safety, school zones, street lighting. Um, they're on the list, they're in the yellow zone, but they have zero funding. So what's the thinking around that? Because if they don't have any funding, that means we're not really planning to do anything, but yet, let, yet they're yellow. So the answer to that question was, is that we haven't, uh, parsed out the money, if you will, as placeholder money. If you go back to the 2000, the 2019 tip that was for 20 through 25 had buckets of money identified. Also in the comp plan, it shows that. Last year, we actually combined them because sidewalks and intersections and, and whatnot kind of all felt the same thing rather than, you know, A through H, we could combine those. But then we thought, well, maybe we should pull them back out. So you know, we just need to put more money back in there, but it's gonna come from the numbers that are on the table because there aren't new revenue streams yet available that we can balance to based on what we think the council has told us. Okay. Um, for the um, project that's underway right now at 202 and East Lake Sammamish Parkway um, that's being worked on, do we have any idea how that's going to alter the traffic flows? This is the one outside the city, Doug? Yes, it is outside the city. Yeah. It's the one at the Whole Foods intersection, but that intersection has a huge impact on the morning flows off of East Lake Sammamish Parkway. We, we would have to um, converse with our counterparts at City of Redmond. We've not done that. Okay. Um, it's a City of Redmond project. And yep. uh, to be honest with you, we, I have not been following it. And uh, so it's something that we can take a look at and see what they can share with us. Okay, and then I know you guys are trying to balance things out, but I also have a, I love efficiencies and I would love if we can, you know, provide direction that whenever there are gonna be, you know, improvements made by developers, that we take a look and see if we need to up the priority on any of the, you know, some of these gap projects and things. The, the biggest project that comes to mind because it's near where I live is Southeast 8th by Big Rock Park, right? There was a lot of, there were a lot of improvements done along there by the developer and we didn't kind of hop on the bandwagon there and do, you know, probably about 20 feet worth of work to extend that to the intersection. Um, and then on the other end, as you kind of approach 212, there would be a, a slight stretch there. But that's a road that because there's a park, a lot of people walk and bike along there. And there's one section, a big section that's now improved, but then the rest of the road still has no shoulder. I mean, part of that road doesn't even have a shoulder. You're like on the road or you're in the ditch. And so it's really unsafe. So I would love to see if there's a way when those things come through, can we coordinate with DCD to know, hey, maybe we need to come back to council and say we need to go work on this because this is an opportunity. It's already gonna be under construction. It's already gonna be torn up or blocked off. Let's finish that so we don't have these partial sections that go nowhere. That would just be my, my, my dream. I, 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 I can, uh, yeah, go ahead, Doug. Yeah, I can, I can take that one. So. Um, it's actually much harder to, to coordinate that than it seems. Um, I actually had, uh, I, I was in community development for a little while and I was uh, one of the many planners on that subdivision. Uh, it actually came in in 2014, I believe. It got appealed twice. It took many, many years to get to the point that it is now. And um, so it's, I'm saying that because it's actually really hard to predict the private development deploying public infrastructure is, um, it, it's very common in the city, right? All the subdivisions have built their frontage improvements and, you know, over time they connect and they should they should create cohesive corridors. And uh, that one was hard because it was in a part of the city that is, uh, for all intents and purposes, much more rural than other parts of the city. And so you had this 36 uh, lot subdivision right in the middle of um, kind of a completely unimproved area. As you mentioned, it's a rural road. It's got very tight shoulders, it's got ditch. Uh, on one side, so it, it has a lot of needs, and the city is currently pursuing that project via grant application. Um, so just the timelines are really hard to mesh. Um, it, 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 you're absolutely right. To the extent that we can do that, it's something we should, uh, but it's, it's actually much harder to do than, um, 
than it seems. Um, just that project is like truly beyond its eighth year um, in, in some form of a process. So um, yeah, it, it can get pretty pretty complicated and nuanced uh, if, you, if you dig into it. But, but we do agree that we, to the extent that we can combine those, absolutely. And I will go to Walmart and see if I can find another wand just for Pam's um, request there, so. Hey, um, I've got pixie dust, but um, yeah, we can we can do that too. All right, thank you very much. Appreciate it, guys. Councilmember Moran. Okay, mine is super quick, um, and it is regarding um, whether we go back and try to fix the TMP or mm -hmm. um, we go and we worked with your system completion program plan, either one. I just want to make sure that um, as we go back and have to, to fix things that we include a section for um, our emergency exit out of the city. I think that's a reasonable request. Um, I think it's something that we are working with Andrew Stevens um, on our emergency plan as well. He has a a study underway to look at the exit routes in the city. Uh, the other thing that I'd like to do is bring our traffic consultant back mm -hmm. and have a dialogue with the council regarding the TMP, the TMP versus the transportation element versus system completion and have a dialogue with the council and see where the council truly wants to go. It's not that I don't, I, I'm not saying I don't wanna do it, but I think what we need to do is have a, a greater dialogue um, amongst this leadership group and um, you know, investigate. You know, how do we go forward, and what is the best way? Is it the TMP and dusting it off? Is it something different? Um, I, I think they're all great ideas, but I think it requires more dialogue. And um, I want to bring our consultant back in and have that with you at a later date as well. Okay, and then you mentioned that, um, and I did have two things. Uh, so you mentioned that eight million came in today from, yeah. or something about eight million coming from the Issaquah School District. Did we finally get something from them on the school down there? Uh, no, I, I, I put $8 million as a placeholder. I really think it's 16 to 20 some million dollars. They, they had identified something in their bond program. Um, we tried to get a hold of Tom Mullins, who wasn't available this week. Okay. Um, whatever that number is, it is their mitigation estimate for the, for the, you know, the lanes, the signal, the frontage improvements, the pedestrian improvements, and the flying T at 40. That's all one big bucket that that eight million will really be probably 24 million, right. whatever the number is gonna be, we just don't have it yet. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, and lastly, lastly, one other thing, because it's been brought up by um, uh, the attorney, Rick Arambru. Uh The issue of an interlocal agreement, last year we began a dialogue with the school district to go after potential grant funding. Uh, we got pretty far along in the framing of that and then um, Rick Arambrou uh, and the attorney's office put a challenge out that we had not done enough environmental work to explore that possibility of extending and widening the intersection as a part of their project. Um, and that was late in the fall when we got that. And so due to the work plans and whatnot with city attorney, uh, Lisa Marshall and I were not able to sit down and evaluate in detail Rick Arambrou's claim of of um, inefficiency or ineffective, whatever the terminology was that he had in his letter. And to date, I'll be honest with you, we have not had the time to go back and reevaluate that with current city attorney, Terry Sand. And so at the moment, there is no plan for an interlocal agreement on the table to pursue grant funding as of yet. We'd like to maybe, but I, I need more bandwidth and you know, city attorney time to be able to really sit down and evaluate the claims and, um, and things that were brought out in that letter from last fall. So I wanted to get that on the table so you understood this concept of an interlocal agreement, where it came from and why it's not moving forward. Okay, thank you. Back to you, Kaylee. Great, thank you guys. Do we have anything else? I know we have about 10 minutes left before we need to extend. Oh, you can't extend? Anyways. Um, so Jeff and Doug, do you guys think you have what you need? <laughs> Um, thank, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, I think we have really good direction. I've written some notes. Uh, we have some cleanup that we need to do on the tip. We need to verify some dollar figures. We need to uh, update the maps. We need to do a few things. So there, there's some cleanup. I didn't hear anything um, like, you know, too, uh, what's, what's the word, but too significant that would make me think that we need to overhaul this. So I think we're 
I'm assuming we're on the right track. It sounds like the questions were less kind of core issues and more like kind of, uh, you know, on the, on the edges issues, I, I think, if that's fair to say. Um, but suffice it to say, we do have some editing we need to do. So there will be another shot for the council to continue to amend this. And that would be on uh, June 7th when we open the public hearing. Um, so I think the only other thing, Audrey, was the stormwater uh, contribution, stormwater utility contribution. I think that was something that we might want to keep at the forefront of conversation for next time. Is that uh, fair to say? We can come back with a little bit more detail, but I think we have some good um, guidance. Tonight. So yeah, I think um, if, if that's okay, I think we'll clean this up and we'll uh, get it back to council and uh, continue the conversation on the seventh. Um, thank you again for the incredible input. I think you know these two workshops uh, today and the 26th of April have honestly been um, in incredibly helpful. Uh, we often don't get enough. Uh, or what I what I mean to say is we often don't get three hours to sit with council and talk about a project. So uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, we know you're taking extra time out of your schedules and. Uh, the deep focus on one topic, I think, is um, really beneficial to us. So I personally uh, appreciate that. I know I'm, sh I'm sure Jeff and Audrey do as well. So um, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you all so much for your hard work. I know we as City Council love all the details, so I'm sure we try and bog down too. So thank you all. Um, all right, well, I would entertain a motion for adjournment. I move to adjourn. All right, moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, 6-0. We are adjourned. <laughs>